Hello, everybody! If it's Wednesday, then that means it's Warhammer. And Warhammer is a broad umbrella that means not only Age of Sigmar, but but also, apparently, the Old World. Uh, that's right. Uh, I have neither of my normal co-hosts. Uh, yeah, both of them bailed. Both of them yeah, bailed. they're awful. They were, they were afraid. Fear in their hearts. They, they, pro they promptly they failed their failed tears. Their yeah, failed terror. Failed terror. They, they failed a terror roll, and boop, they were out of there. They broke and fled. Uh, and so tonight we are going to be discussing the old world. Uh, I have brought in two experts, uh, Brendan and Chuck. In as much as anyone can be an expert at this point, the three of us have are all enthusiasts of this new opportunity to play with our Warhammer toys more. And uh, Chuck, I'll let you say hi to everybody. How you doing, buddy? Good, good. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Quick shout out to my gaming club I abandoned tonight after a quick thousand point game, the Barn Owls. Hope you guys are doing well playing Sigmar without me. Very nice. Also, Brendan, he's joining us. His camera's frozen, but he is here. He, he's here. He's just thoughtful. He's pensive. What's up, Brendan? Perfect. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you, Vince? I am very good, my brother. Uh, the three of us are going to be talking through the old world. We're going to focus tonight on the rules, this game, what it's like things that might be different from previous editions, things that are the same from very old editions, things we like, things we hate or don't like, and things we're not sure about. And we're just going to kind of give the whole the whole run through. Um, we'll do more shows on it in the future, talking about like individual armies and stuff like that. I, don't, I look at this as like, hey, great, now we have two different games I get to cover uh, about uh, a game in miniatures that I love. So there we go. Uh, all right, but first off, of course, we're going to do the news. Since I don't have my normal co-hosts, I'll go ahead and do it tonight. I won't just pass it over to somebody else. So let's get into it. We do have a little bit of news. I mean, first off, Old World on pre-release. That's the big first news. Uh, so wild pre-release adventures for many people. Many things out of stock, but some things not. Uh, that Tomb King box still available here in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. Chuck, what did you, did you did you pick up anything? Yes, so I picked up uh, all the books. So core rulebook, both arcane journals, fantasy, forces of fantasy, ravening hordes, and the Bretonian box, as well as all the cards. Uh, I saw. I think the dice in America was were delayed. I was going to buy the generic set, as poor financial decision as that was. I was going to buy sure, it. Sure. But uh, but the stock levels have saved me on that. But um, I, I won't lie. On the twentieth, I'm going out to my Warhammer store to enjoy the festivities and paint up a Bretonian model. And if they have the Tomb Kings box in house, I may buy one still. So <laughs> we'll see, see what happens, but uh, almost everything. Speaking of dice, you should have seen the very fun adventure. So Brendan and I got a game in on Saturday night um, on pre-release day. We celebrated by playing the game and uh, both of us still have square based armies. They were ready to go. And, uh, you should have seen the fun adventure that we had of me digging around my basement, trying to find the <laughs> artillery dice. Okay. Like I had scatter dice everywhere, but I couldn't find mm -hmm. the artillery dice. And then, so we, I finally found one. We play the game. And then I look in my dice tray that I have specifically on my Warhammer table where I keep all my like D6s and just a couple extra ancillary dice to mark things. And there were like three artillery dice just, just sitting, sitting there. in there. Yeah, that I had forgotten about. Never bothered to look in that thing. Because I was like, why would they be there in the normal dice? Because somewhere deep in my soul I knew. Uh <laughs> there you go. Brendan, what about you? Did you uh did you end up picking up anything? Uh just all the books, right? The the cores, good, bad. Um because I have an Empire Army, I've got a Beastman Army. And then the Arcane Journals, um, just because I really like the lore that goes with Warhammer Fantasy Battles. And sure. I, I like just going through the rules of what every army does and all the different characters. And sometimes it inspires me to, to try something else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like the cool part about the Arcane Journals, and we'll talk about it because it's going to come up mm -hmm. later in the show in a big way is, you know, the, the, that you get a lot of cool information and expansion for the army, and excitingly, in a time period we're not familiar with, right? Yeah. So for, for things like Bretonia, that's like a lot of new stuff. You look at the Tomb King book, it's like mostly stuff you already know, because those people mm -hmm. were alive for like thousands of years before we met them, and they're, you know, alive for not long after we met them, frankly. Most of them die and become nothing, become space dust. But 
they were alive 500 years in, in 2276 or whatever when this game set. All right, cool. Next news item. Spearhead. Uh, this new Stormcast Eternals Spearhead box. Uh, so this is 10... What are they called? Vigilors? Is that right? I don't know. The dudes with swords. Is that what they're called? Or is that the shooter guys? <laughs> with spears. No, the vigilors are the shooting guys. Swords. Vanquishers? Okay. Vanquishers? Vanquishers. There it is. Yeah. Ah, stupid Stormcast names. I will never remember you, even <laughs> though I play this army. Um, uh, so, at any rate, yes, Vanquishers. Thank you. As well as the Andrasta, three of the... Um, Annihilators. Annihilators. And then the dude with the banner who's on the same sprue as the Andrasta, so has to be in this box, Sir Banner Actually, Man. The uh, Annihilators are also on that sprue, too, so... Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that little pack Perfect. is just all on one sprue, so it's like, well, they're all going in. Mm-hmm. And then the Chariot. Uh, but what we should really call this, because we all know what this is. This is Combat Patrol... For fourth edition, right? I mean, like, everybody said it. I'm not breaking any news here. I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said a million times on the internet. Because, obviously, Combat Patrol was very successful. Obviously, AOS has no good, like, path of entry into the game. You just basically are like, I don't know, make a whole army, I guess. Right? Because yeah. it, there's no real way to play other than, than 2K for the most part. Other than, like, if you have a very good friend... Who explains to you how doubles events work and so this is clearly just like okay this is going to be our combat patrol equivalent for fourth edition wherein all the boxes are balanced against each other and you're meant to play at like the one box level the lists are what's in the box you play the box against the box i mean like duh um so okay cool fine good i want this kind of on road i want more support mm-hmm. for lower point games so i'm here for it uh, I'm curious too because with the combat patrol they actually slim down the rules a little bit so it's not yeah. as full feature so I wonder if if that is the case and that's what we're getting if it'll be the same or because Sigmar's not hard to grasp as a basic core like scroll yeah like type of game so I wonder how how if it will slim down at all or if it's just gonna like they're just balanced yeah I don't know it could be that they don't really need to cut much because AOS doesn't have some of the complexity that 40k has right when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, like you're not making a bunch of different weird choices and stuff like that on AOS units uh, in the way you are in 40K units, right? So, uh, I mean, look, maybe they'll change some simple stuff. Maybe they won't. I just want the game to have a functional entry point that actually is fun to play. That's all I really care about. So just that's the bar, guys, right? That That's the bar. Make it so when someone walks into their store, the proprietor of that store can go, oh, are you interested in AOS? Okay, well, these boxes, these 24 boxes, whatever, you know, one per army, whatever it amounts to, right? All you need to do is figure out which one of these you think looks cool. Tell me about what type of stuff you like. And then you buy this box. And if your friend has one of these boxes, you can play against anyone else using one of these boxes. But this is you need. You buy this, you put it together, you paint it. There you go. Like, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. And put those rules online somewhere for free. So... A veteran can pull out those models they probably have to play that new person who just showed up with this random box. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Very good. Uh, all right. Next up, the LVO preview is coming. Uh, when is LVO again? <laughs> it's like uh, two weeks from now. Next basically. next Wednesday, Wednesday it starts. Yeah. Next Wednesday, yeah. next Thursday. Yes. Yeah. Let's do this week. So, yeah, so next week. There you go. So that is to say then next week uh, we will get our preview show. Uh, that's when this is. So it's about about a week from today. Uh, and we're going to get some previews for, as far as from, from our perspective, AOS, Warcry, and Underworlds, Death Gorge, the latest in a long-running series of what seems like double entendres, uh, in the Warhammer Underworlds uh, product line, where I, at this point, as I've said before, I do fully believe that their goal with Underworlds is to make every single subtitle name a double entendre, like every single one of them. That's just, I think it's intentional now. They've done it too many it's, times. That's where the, all the greatest models will live. Sure. Um, but they've changed the card backs, and I, I think 
the last couple, the last one or two, the narrative didn't really foreshadow the narrative we got in Sigmar. So I, I, more wondering what this game is about other than cool models. I thought it was the place where we go to get cool replacement models for our characters. And, and oh. I think that's the only point now. That's the only point now, I think. Yeah, we also use it to sneak in resculpts of very outdated models. Like, um, if you if you need a new, I don't know, like, Ogre Hunter or something. Like, that's how you'll sneak Listen, it into just, the game, right? Just make another Doc Warband and I will buy all of it. Sure. That's all I need. Sure. <laughs> that's what that game is for me. Is it Doc? Yeah. Nope, I'm moving on. I was really surprised not to see the old world on this list. Like, you're just releasing the game, and they're not going to talk about the roadmap or future of it, like, at all. I mean, I understand the difference between Specialist Design Studio and the normal game studio, but they have the Horus Heresy on here, and that comes out of Specialist Design Studio. So why not just, like, say, put up, like, one slide or something that's like, hey, and some more Arcane Journals are coming. Like, anything. You gotta have some kind of plans over the year. What's going they spent, on, guys? They spent four years writing this, Vince. They're tired. Yeah. You know, it. like, you've been through lots of project launches. It, it just came out. You gotta give your team a chance to relax. You know, they haven't thought about maybe what comes next. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. Could be anything. <laughs> exactly. Could be, there, could be dwarves for all we know. <laughs> their release plan is we put it out there. We see what people think and what they want. It's about six months from now, we'll start working on it. Well, that's when we'll start doing some new things. So <laughs> I look forward to 2026 when round two of the releases comes out for this game. Um, that's amazing. Uh, so, but yeah, look forward to seeing what's AOS Warcry, uh, also known as AOS uh, additional model supply game number two uh and of course underworlds so you know here's the thing that bothers me about this can i just leave this on one quick note that really bothers me why aren't kill team and death gorge underworlds switched why isn't the left column the sci-fi column and the right column the fantasy column why are these two switched like this they have to alternate because if you had all 40k first, uh -huh. you would have 30,000 people on the stream and then sure. it would drop down to 15. You need to mix it so you keep it, keep those numbers up, keep that average high. Look, you could, you could but, do it in whatever order you want during the show. You mean aesthetically? Just asking, yeah, on oh, okay. the marketing slick, these two should be switched. Who is in their marketing department? <laughs> Somebody made this artifact, okay? And I, if this got said to me for review and I was in the product team, I would say, can you please switch these two so the sci-fi one is in one column and the fantasy is in another column because that's how people's brains work. It's a problem. And they keep doing it. And it bothers me. So, anyways, I'm never going to let this go. Listen, GW marketing person, I, I see you. I see you. You're very underappreciated. You work hard producing all these silly artifacts for all these different announcements and things they have to do. Uh, so, but, but fix this. Stop this. Okay. All right. That's the news. Uh, let's, uh, gentlemen, let's talk about some pick of the week, uh, before we get into the old world. But, uh, Brendan, why don't you start us off there, bud? What, where, where, where would you like to begin for some pick of the week? Yeah. So, so my pick of the week was go sign up for Adepticon. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been involved as an organizer in some capacity since 2018. Um, I have been the champs to the last two years. Boo hiss. Um, one of the, one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten a lot, uh, really since 2019 was people wanted more, uh, one day activities. So, um, this year more than ever, we have more, events on the age of sigmar side than we've ever had on offer we have uh two sessions of the gibbering dome we have another uh, narrative event in the festmere conflict that's a new narrative event we have Dawnbringers, which is a 1000 point event on saturday on thursday i'm running um a 3000 point tournament and then on friday i'm running what i'm calling the legacy format where basically all old models are you know as long as you can get me a war scroll for it is going to be legal and We've got Whoa. some different activities. Mm. Um, running so, side quest now. You've, you've, yeah. you've capped the max level on TO. You're like, let's side quest it out. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm really excited about that one because there's some old missions I plan on digging out and, and third edition-ifying uh, for it. So I, I think that'll be fun. But 
one of the big things we've gotten from people is we want more one day so that we can free up our con to do other things. We still have champs. We still have teams. Um, you know, it's really looking forward to that. So there's spots for everything still, I believe. So go sign up, um, adepticon.org and pick out what you like. Obviously it's a huge convention. Um, you know, there's, there's 40 K there is an old world event. Uh, I have no hand in running that it's sold out immediately, uh, which was pretty cool. So I'm, I'm sure that they'll be looking to, to get more space for that just because of the demand for it was really high. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's my pick of the week. Uh, Mr. Tristan Gray asked, uh, champs is when, what, what, what days is champs in this year? Is the actual champs? Yeah. So champ, champs is Thursday, Friday. Um, because now that we're doing the teams format for the age of Sigmar side, uh, the teams format for 40 K has been the big showpiece event for Adepticon for a number of years. They want the same thing on the age of Sigmar side so that those two events are side by side and for the, and for the display on Saturday night to just keep it all going that way. Very nice. And uh, I will be judging again, paint judging for the AOS event. So looking forward to seeing some awesome armies there this year. Uh, and Travis Griffin says he's taking Tomb Kings to the legacy uh, at Tristan Gray. Very nice. There you go. Going to be a few of those, I imagine. I imagine so. Here, they're they're yeah. back in a big way now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, very nice. All right. Uh, okay. Chuck, what do you got for everybody for pick of the week? Uh, I took the Tyler style to mm, fulfill that did. role. This, this. You did. <laughs> so uh, three picks. So uh, obviously face uh, old world content. Face Hammer, Russ over there is doing a great job uh, with his coverage of the old world. Uh, also want to shout out the Square-based uh, podcast. Uh, Rob and Val over there are doing a phenomenal job and definitely developing a nice community. I jumped into their Discord. Uh, it's nonstop. I actually had to mute it because it is truly nonstop. <laughs> and then the... Uh, Shoot, actually, I sent this to you a while ago. What was the third one? Um, okay. Don't what was worry. the third one I said, Vince? I've got your third pick because it's Thank coming you. at you with irresistible force. It is the Dwellers, Dwellers Below, Below coming oh. back. There Very you go. True. Uh, yeah, they have one episode out now. Uh, that's just a pure nostalgia hit. Those those gents over there, just I, I, I listen to them. I want to grab a beer, and I just want to sit for the four hours that they're going to talk about Old World. So, yeah, happy to have them back. Agreed. I love the Dwellers guys. They're all great guys. I'm proud to have been part of uh, the recording of the only episode they ever did that was so bad and went off the rails so horribly that they could never release it to the public without ruining uh, reputations of pretty much everybody involved. And uh, it was just it was just awful. And uh, they never released it. So there you go. That's lost to time and uh, we're all the better for it. Um, but the, uh, I was, I, I too picked up and listened to that Dwellers episode. I've been listening to Square based a bunch, but I listened to a bunch of Russ's stuff. I'm with you. Those are all, you picked many of the things that I was going to say, but instead, uh, I'm going to pick something else that I've been, che- that I checked out, which was our good friends, Andy and Rem, uh, Mr. Remington Steele, good for good old friends from the good old days, uh, who are back and did their own old world review show, taking a look at it. Uh, so I have linked that down there as well. Always good to see those two gentlemen hanging out together, talking. Uh, Rem, uh, getting in some old world discussion in between his his like world touring as a musician. Uh, so you know, like this guy, this guy's around here touring all over the world, playing in a band, and he still manages to find a little time to get on and talk about toy soldiers. He's like the coolest guy. Uh, so uh, there you go. Uh, at any rate. Uh, Check all those out. Everything is linked down in the description because tonight I actually have two co-hosts who are responsible and sent me their links early. So I was able to post all of them in advance. Unlike what Tom does. Why I'm allowed to forget about it because I sent it to you. I'm like, it's in it's in Vince's hands now. He can tell me what my picks were. I sent it to him. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So check all of those out. And uh, yeah, I've been I've been absorbing a great deal of that content. So thank you to all the content producers who were working hard this weekend. Uh, let's talk about some hobby time, gentlemen. A little hobby time, Brendan. Obviously, you're not gonna be able to show anything, Mister Frozen Camera. But what have you yeah, been working sorry. on? Oh, it's all good. Uh, yeah. So I've been working on. So I play in the Adepticon teams uh, every year, and um, you got to start early. So I have been working on my part of our teams. 
Uh, my part this year is uh, Iron Jaws, so I'm going with the more traditional kind of yellow Iron Suns uh, I saw color. one of the models. It looks really good. Yep, and uh, really looking forward to what we're doing as a team this year. I I won't quite spoil it, right? So in previous years, we did the big uh, Red Keep. We did uh, the four seasons of Sylvaneth. And this year, we're going a, a different direction. We're still going to go big display board. We're still going to go lots of conversions, but um, we're going to we're going to take on something that I don't think anybody's done yet on the AOS side uh, very effectively. Yeah, uh, the uh, your team is known for the most ridiculous display boards. Like, if people don't know what he's mentioning when he says the Red Keep, this is one of the most legendary display boards that has ever been at an event ever it, it, it's actually it's so there. big i would say they need to make another category because it's bigger than a display board it is yeah it was like four display epic. board size put together basically. yeah it's amazing and it was more than six feet tall so <laughs> yeah that's that's all mr trunzo that's uh he's we break up the the labor across the teams um but he basically insists that he does the display board and we're all completely fine with that. Yeah. Tronzo's not short. I say this to say when the display board was up on the tables, he had this extra thing he could do. Like the, the one of the models sat at the top of the tower and he had to have a stepladder so that he yep. could get up on the stepladder to put the model back in its position. Okay. And he's like, I don't know. How tall is Tronzo? Six, six, one, six, two, somewhere in that range probably. Right. So like his reach is pretty high and he couldn't get there. He had to get up higher. That's how ridiculous this thing was. If you search for for sort of the Red Keep Display Board Adepticon on Google, I'm sure you'd find it. I wish I had a picture I could bring up. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was, that giant it was on the GW page. page. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Uh, okay. So, uh, all right. Let's. Uh, what about you, there, Chuck? What have you been working on? What's what's been your hobby time? Well, my most of my hobby time, the biggest part is a project I cannot talk about. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sitting right over yes. here. Vince knows that idea well. Um, if you're going to be at LVO, I, goes. yeah, tomorrow's going to be a 16 hour day, so I can ship it out Friday. But if you're going to be at LVO, you may be able to see it. Uh, so wait for that. Outside of that, playing with my game group, uh, the Barn Owls, uh, we're playing a lot of old fantasy. We play 8th edition. We have never really stopped the past couple of years. We started off an AOS map campaign tonight. Um, Love a map campaign. The next thing. Uh, it's so it's so fun. We're actually doing a duel. So there's our, our, the Ohio Sister Club, uh, Ren Four, yep. uh, who made the actual campaign and did all the printing. So it's two map campaigns at once that will cross pollinate with uh, over the next year, uh, which is actually good because Old World's going to take a lot of us by storm. So this guarantees once a month we will get Age of Sigmar games in, so we don't lose track sure. of that, which is a good thing. Nice. Uh, and and but once this big project that I can't talk about is over with. I have a whole Living Cities army ready and waiting, primed, and I just want to dive in and start painting it slowly. <laughs> Very nice. I love it. I love it. Uh, for myself, my hobby time. So first of all, I finished up this guy right here. Uh, this is the Bretonian uh, Duke or whatever. I gave him the Baron's head because I like the Baron's head better, the little flat top helmet as opposed to the closed night helm. Like I like a little. I like the fact that he has a. A very expressive face with a nice mustache, but I'll use him as a duke or a baron, whatever. It doesn't matter. Who cares? And uh, so I painted this guy up. I love the new Bretonian uh, Pegasus. I was always a fan of the Pegasuses. Um, so, and I did the sort of dark Pegasus look. Uh, I saw that they, mm-hmm. this was like on the website, one of the painters, one of the heavy metal painters did that or whatever. And I thought it looked cool. So I did that too. Um, so I did that guy. And then I'm working on something else that for some reason I can't share with everyone. Uh, so I'll just say it's on this base right here. Um, that's what's working on. I can show a base. This is just me holding Ooh. a base. Um, what could it big be? Base. Who knows? This is a big base. Could be anything. Could be anything. a boat. Yeah. Could be a boat. Could be a model on that base even. There could be. Um, but that's the other thing that I'm 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 working on, and uh, it's a it's a bit of a project. Uh, but uh, I'm very 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 excited about what I'm doing here. Uh, so we'll we'll see how it all comes together. Okay. With hobby time concluded, I'm going to say to everybody, hey, if you haven't hit like yet, please do so. 
I imagine this will be a rather controversial episode. And by that, what I mean is before I logged in today, we started the show. We already had some people hit and dislike because we're talking about the old world. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people who are out there wanting to yuck each other's yums on both sides. Uh, that is to say, like, there's people who are going to be like, why are you talking about the old world? And just like the people who were like, why do you like AOS? Hey. I don't like yeah. any of that. I like playing with my toys. I like Warhammer models. Uh, and although um, the old world is not the most interesting setting to me, I'll be honest, I do like that we're in a new time period here, you know, sort of 500 years before in 2276. So it is at least something new to explore. And I do think we're telling some interesting stories there. But you can have two things. You can like two things. Or you can dislike one of them. That's okay. I If, you, if this isn't the game for you, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't play this game. And yeah, I you think, shouldn't I think feel bad about Haywo, it. Haywo said it best. It's not for me. I hope they get what they want. That's right. Exactly. Which is which is the the best thing. You don't need to hate on any way, shape, or form. If you don't like 40k, don't play it. That's fine. If you don't like Sigmar, that's fine. Don't play it. If you don't like fantasy, that's fine. Don't play it. Right. Just let us have our fun. That's and for right. those, of us, those of us who love all of it, well, we're just poor and good luck to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have just made poor financial decisions with our life. That's right. So, but if, for for those of you who are here and are interested, hit that like button. Uh, it does help other people find the show, and it help it helps uh, it helps fight the haters by spreading some positivity. So, hit like, hit subscribe, do all those things. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Hendrick said, "I play like five games. I can fit one more in." There you go. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Nice. That's the right attitude. Okay. The champion. Yes, exactly. Um, as someone who consistently writes games and releases them, believe me, I understand. Hendrick, what you're going through, like, because oftentimes when I'm, we'll be like, I'm writing a, a new game at the same time that I'm like marketing and we're talking about the game we just released. And so I have to like get my brain in the right space. And I'm also playing AOS and it's just like, what is going on here? Uh, so anyways, let's talk about uh, core rules and this whole release and this whole thing in the old world. Let's get into it. All right. Let me go ahead and timestamp this bad boy here. Now I'm going to start, we're going to start with a little bit of an overview. Okay. Before anything, I want to get into just 40, 50,000 foot view, 40,000 foot view. We're so high above. We're up in the aeroplane looking down on this vast landscape that is not Europe. Uh, and so I despite the fact that uh, as a as a just I'll give you a little quick spoiler here I actually quite like the game um but I'm still going to make fun of the fact that it's not Europe and uh not France is in a war with uh you know not Egypt um so that's you know I'm never going to let that joke go so get used to it okay here's my overview gentlemen I'll be looking to get your feedback after this okay quick quick thoughts I think a cursory examination, like I think a lot of people's first read on this was that it's just like going to end up being a reskinned eighth. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's true at all. Uh, I don't like that actually feels the more I read, the less that feels accurate. I think this draws a lot more on some older editions, specifically fifth, sixth, that kind of uh, slightly old to middle hammer more than anything else. A little bit of Middle Earth strategy battle game mixed in here for fun as well. Um, I, there are a few larger changes. We'll talk about them, but what actually happened here is you've got a lot of, when I say changes, I mean like over the previous edition, like things people would take at notice as differences. So there are a few, there, there are lots of small differences, but they amount to something quite clever and tight in the way that it changes the overall experience. Um, the downside here to this game is this is not a game for new players like by that i mean like a completely new person to war games or something like that i cannot imagine the world where if somebody was getting into war games i would be like hey you know what you should try the old world not even a chance you better have years under your belt before you take this on this thing is 250 pages of rules 250 250 that's a lot that is a lot of rules some might say too many uh, but it's a lot. And the complexity level on this is very high. Very high. This is like the most complex game they've released by far. And 
Uh, overall, I just want to say the army release and book strategy is great, and I wish we'd adopt the same thing for AOS. By that, I mean, here's your two tomes. This is all the good guys. This is all the bad guys for AOS. It would be like, this is the order, destruction, death, chaos, grand alliances. And then here's some expandopedias full of special characters and, and neat armies of renown and other stuff like that. I like, I would, I would, I would be so ever thankful if we did that release strategy for AOS. Uh, cause I love it. All right. That's my quick overview. Uh... Chuck, I'm going to go to you first. And what? Uh, any disagreement, thoughts, feedback, additional items? Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of go point by point. So the, your first point about being a reskin eighth, I thought that too as the articles were coming out. And then as soon as I watched my first battle report, I was like, oh no, different. And that was fine. Uh, and it was actually exciting. So it wasn't going to be just like kind of a, an, a known system. There's a lot more changes. I agree. A lot of fifth and sixth pulled in a little bit of. I think even a little bit of uh, Warhammer Ancients pulled in. Like they they went all the way back as they could, and whatever game system that was Warhammer pulled from, which is good because, like I said, it made it very unique. Uh, and I, I, from what it looks like, a really good system, uh, yeah, really yeah. good Warhammer system. Um, I will disagree with the downside of 250 pages of rules because even though I have an app, uh, there's more than 250 War Scrolls. <laughs> um, <laughs> more than 250 uh, data slates. Uh, it's just the rules are more upfront in one book as opposed to being spread out across the armies. Downside to that is in Sigmar, I can walk up and, and play you, Vince, in an army I don't know, and you have the rules, and I can put the onus on you to tell me those rules. It's a little bit more upfront where you kind of need to know a lot more to play the basic game. Um, but at the same time, I would also counter, is it a game for new players? I, I wouldn't even say that because I started in 8th edition. Uh, Vince, when did you start? What what, what edition? Fourth edition. Uh, Brendan, what about you? What edition of Warhammer did you start? Uh, in fantasy, I played what amounted to a month of sixth edition. I got the bulk of my play started in seventh. So, I mean, where we're at, it wasn't an easy onboarding process, but it was still able to onboard. And just because we've seen outside of Plato's Cave doesn't mean people can't look at the Shadow Stone and enjoy themselves. <laughs> No, as we get them fair. into this. By the yeah. way, I, I knew that war scroll argument was going to come up, so I have a fun yep. rebuttal for that, okay? By the it's way, the easiest one, so I figured I'd get I it know, out early. I know, and And, like, again, spoilers, I like this game. I do think it's 250 pages, and that's insane, but they made a tight, yep. clever, impressive, and fun rule set. Like, it's, it's huge, it's complex, but it's good, okay? It's not yep. like I'm not making a normative judgment, just to be super clear to everybody. So if that's your thing... This is you're gonna have a great time with this, but Chuck, okay, a unit of tomb guard, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Depending on exactly how you choose to kit them, or whatever, like rules, but the way I would build my tomb guard, like the way they're built as modeled, and the way I would choose to. Build well, hold on, before you go deeper, are they on chariots or are they on foot? No, no, I, I understand that. Okay, we're gonna right. talk about yeah, that yeah, as a yeah, positive yeah. thing. I love that. I'm so here for that. Okay. Very excited. But no, just your standard old Tomb Guards. Your regular, run-of-the-mill, slightly elite dead guys. Yeah? These are, these are not like... Like, I got way more special things in my army. This is just like my kind of special infantry dudes that aren't normal skelly bellies. Right? Okay? They have 14 special rules, Chuck. 14. Now, I'm not talking about understanding how strength and hit and weapon skill and all that stuff works. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm not counting any of that crap. Okay? I'm saying special rules I need to understand and utilize that will potentially have an impact on how this thing plays. 14, Chuck. 14. Okay. That's right. a lot. If if they published an AOS War Scroll with 14 <laughs> special rules on it, okay, we would riot. But that's what you can do when you start hiding crap under universal special rules when you only have to write two words. Okay? You can just make things that if you wrote them out, they would be egregious. All right? But that's real. Okay. So, at any rate, that's why I don't buy that. Like, I don't. No, no AO... It takes five AOS War Scrolls to get equal to one unit. Uh, I, I, listen, with Grand Strategies, Battle Tactics, Sub-Factions, Magic Spells... I would say it gets closer than maybe we we, we would say here, but also admit. I, 
You're you're also, not wrong there, and also bury battle tactics in the in the dirt and probably yes, sub factions too. Uh, yes, we can. T- the complexity of current AOS third is a whole separate discussion. But yeah, I'm with you. Yes, and keep okay. in mind, we all love Age of Sigmar here, and we all love Fantasy. So it's... that's right. Yes, yes. Coming from a place <laughs> of love with both of these games. That's right. Yes. All right, Brendan, hit me. I want your thoughts. Jump in here. Uh, overview. What did I, what did I miss? What what are your thoughts here at, at a high level? Yeah. So the problem is that you and I, Vince, have talked so much about this before the show already. <laughs> yes. um, so I, I fear that a lot of my takes are just going to be Vince, but a little bit dumber. Um, I doubt the, that. So, the, I mean, the nail on the head part of it, and Chuck mentioned it, and, and it's there in the notes, is at first pass, it feels like 8th edition. And the... And so I read my 8th edition rulebook in preparation for this to launch. Because I went, it's been, it's been a while since I've played Fantasy. I'll just get a refresher, be all that. That was in my head. I start watching battle reports, and I go, oh, that's, that's a little different. Mm-hmm. And you know, we start seeing some other things go, oh, that's, boy, that's a, that's a much older handbook, the way that rule worked. Um, I think one of the most critical elements that is the way you think it works is fear. Um, You have to be a fear causing unit and have your unit strength be greater than what it is that you're opposed to. And I, as a beastman player, remember fear being or terror, like the worst thing in the world. Sure. um, Because I was bravery like four and like, yep, I got charged by a giant. This unit ran my whole army ran sweet. Good game. Really appreciated that. Um, (laughs) There feels like there's more balancing mechanics in the game by intention and by design yep. than there used to be in in the older editions of Fantasy. And I watched a great battle report today. It was High Elves versus Beastmen. And I'm used to, you know, the elf nonsense. And I thought, this Beastman player is going to get just his face kicked in. Like, there's there's no way. But... It, it felt like both players had a good and meaningful opportunity to win that game, and the decisions that they made over the course of that game were balanced by the rules that existed, both yep. in, in their profiles and those larger special rules as a whole. Um, I, I will say, though, it is a mountain to try and understand how much rules there are. And, you know, Chuck, I'm a guy who, in Age of Sigmar, you can put down basically any unit uh, across the table from me, I know pretty well what that war scroll looks like, and that's not a normal thing to have. Every player has to have when they come to that table that kind of knowledge when you're dealing with that 200 pages. And you know, to talk about the entry points for beginners, um, I started playing Warhammer Fantasy Battles as as a teenager, and my introduction to it was a lot of hand holding by what I would later come to learn were very competitive players in, in Warhammer fantasy that were bringing me along and, and let me make ton of mistakes. And we, we basically started playing doubles because there was a couple of people my age who wanted to start playing. We didn't have armies. They'd bring their second armies with them. We play double events and we would just pair, you know, a veteran player and a younger player. And, and we go about it that way. And that's a totally legitimate way to go about doing this. But 100%. If, yep. if you and your buddy are, both new to this. I mean, man, I I can't imagine how big of a mountain this must feel like because when we were recording my latest episode of Cubic Shenanigans, my co-host Dan had never played Warhammer Fantasy. Dan is, you know, in his mid 60s, he's played every war game under the sun it seems like. There's no set of rules that he hasn't seen before and he said to me he goes, "Who is this for? This is crazy." It's like <laughs> I was like, damn, this is not a game for you. I promise. <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, I'll happily teach him if you wanted, but the um, there feels like, and I was worried at first it wasn't going to seem that way, but there's a lot of intention in the way that, that some of this broke out in terms of the rules itself. Yep. I, I can't speak to some of the other decisions that were made uh, around the game, but at least the rule set itself feels really intentional on how it all interacts with each other. And and that was super cool to see. Completely agreed. Completely agreed. Yeah. All right. 
let's get let's let's move to a little high let's move from overview to some high level thoughts i know it sounds like the same thing but it's different why is it different don't worry about it uh because i needed two slides for all the summarization things and i wanted to name them different titles uh you you make the prezzo if you've got a problem what do you what do you want all right come yeah. at me no. yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, do warhammer daily come on yeah exactly one up them uh, you know, I agree. That's a wonderful bridge to this, to this, mm -hmm. uh, to this next sort of the high level thoughts. This game is very well designed and thought through. I like your statement of intentionality. You really do feel it once you start reading in there. Like it's, it is well thought through. They've handled corner cases. They've made everything clear. You can trace from A to B. There's generally going to be an answer to the questions you have in the book the sort of secondary and tertiary consequences of a lot of design decisions have clearly been thought through, right? And they've they've come with what seems like a pretty, uh, uh, you know, like impressively balanced now. I mean, over time, we'll see. I don't know if there's broken combinations. Who knows at this point? Like, whatever. I'm sure there are. I'm sure yeah, there we'll are, find them like, eventually. Yeah, but like, I don't care about that. Like, stacked, like stacked up and being played kind of within the spirit of what's written there, it feels like things are definitely well aligned. But they are cumbersome. You are talking about stacks on stacks on stacks of rules. Like A will reference B, B will reference C, C will reference D. Like oftentimes you will have to go down a rules rabbit hole to actually find the answer of like how a thing works, right? Um, like that's just the nature of, of the thing. Uh, and the i think i want to talk for i want this is this is the point gentlemen where we have a quick discussion about the initial armies that are in the game versus the supporting PDFs. no they're all in the game they're all in the okay. game i don't want to hear it that's fine <laughs> we, we you can tell like I, I think you've staked out your position right yeah. um but obviously we have the situation where they've said these are the nine armies in the old world that will be supported and these are the PDFs that we're going to put out for the other armies, right? And so this is the two worlds we live in. And how exactly we're all supposed to feel about that, I think, is a very personal thing. It's very up in the air. Like, if your army is one of the ones that's just one of the supported ones, you're probably like, okay, whatever, no skin off my nose. If you were, you know, really, really here for Skaven, uh, sorry about your luck, right? Um, as, as was the giant rat that makes all the rules in our chat right now, which is one of my favorite names. Not my favorite. That's clearly arrested at the Waffle House. I don't know if you're here arrested at the Waffle House. I hope you watch this. Always my favorite, my favorite name for a viewer there. But Chuck, I, I mean, you, you already said you're, you're sort of where you're coming down, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. I, I, it feels like with, with the way everything we've seen so far with the initial release that I don't think that they would have just passed on the legacy armies and also like legacy, not legend. Um, so they're, they're getting rules. I have a feeling that the rule set that comes out for them is going to be as full as what we see in forces of fantasy and ravening hordes. Sure. Obviously arcane journals are additional on top of that. They're not getting that. That's fine. We, we knew that for months in advance. Um, the only point of contention for me is that they're not going to be viable for tournaments obviously that's gw specific but as someone right. who also tos for gw that's a point where i'm like i kind of disagree because i have a feeling they'll be okay and i don't know why that decision was made um like personally any events i run that's not for games workshop i'm going to allow all of them i think it's going to be perfectly fine sure uh and i think they'll be in and also too let, let's be honest if you look at those legacy armies you can buy most of those much more readily than you can say hi oh yeah sure uh, or what 100%. else at the moment so yeah. uh i don't know what the decision was i'm not privy to any of that nor do i try to figure out what that is it's that's that's beyond me but um i think they're gonna be perfectly viable to play at any level um so if you are worried if you're a dark elf player like i have dark elves too if you're a dark elf player um and you're worried like oh well, gw said they're not tournament legal just play them you're going to be perfectly fine obviously if you go to an event ask your to just like anything else but I, I'm not concerned with them being underpowered. I just they're not going to be supported, which we all knew for a long time. Sure. Brendan, where, where are you where are you happening on this? What's your what's your thoughts? Yeah, certainly at initial release, I I don't see a reason why non GW tournament organizers wouldn't wouldn't allow it. Um, 
you know, maybe two or three years down the line as the game evolves, I could see an argument being made for, hey, these maybe don't don't really fit, but that's because the game will have ideally evolved. You know, if everybody's got an arcane journal and the power level isn't quite there, but then that's right, oh the dangerous word comp. Um, but that's a situation where you sit down and you say, if there truly is this huge disparity in people being able to play this game and have fun, how much more does it take to bring them back into the field? Is it another two hundred points? Is it, you know, Right. Um, or to, to throw this out, since Brendan, you and I both TO, like, it, it, is it is the option for this to have a community establish an, a pseudo arcane journal for these armies, or to just say no arcane journals? Hmm? No. That, that's I that's mean, the if, question. I, I don't know if, if that's the deal breaker. Answer, sure. Because um, yeah. the thing that I really like about the arcane journals, as far as I understand them, is its you know is its army composition change and its access to the special characters and. And we remember from fantasy, there were some special characters that were that were backbreaking, um, really in the end times. Looking at you, Malekith. Yeah. Um, and Ariel, I get that. I know that. <laughs> yeah, it right. It happens. If the special yeah. characters the problem, right? Then we pull the special characters. If if it's so clear and so obvious where the problem is because of development, I I don't think that some of the things that it takes to fix it wouldn't be so hard to do. Um, it, it seems like a strange decision, again, to your point, Chuck, that they would say, hey, you can't play these at GW events. I get that they're trying to focus in on a specific thing, but I want to say that for the Horus Heresy, they did the same thing to begin with, and then those other ones got books, but obviously the, the scope of it is a little bit different. Sure. Um, and I'd be surprised that some of these armies never, ever got anything ever in the history of them running a an old rank and flank fantasy game like that. It just seems odd to me. They might move the focus over there where they become the primary armies, but I I don't know. That seems it seems a little odd to me. Yeah, and you know I've seen a lot of people sort of hopium their way into saying like, well, eventually they'll have to support them and they'll add them, and we will get books eventually. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Maybe like, like I'm gonna take them at face value here. I can't react to what the future brings. Sure, that could happen. They could uh, that super success could happen, and they could end up getting books or full support. Yeah, it's possible. The game could also fail, and then they could just be like, nah, like, never mind. We tried it, and it didn't Done. work, and we're just going to let yeah, it try and on. slowly die after a couple of years, right? Like, if you're going to consider the super rosy case, you've got to consider the, consider the super negative. And I don't like to to mess around with any of that, because who knows what the future brings. I like to talk about the here and now and what it is. And I think what it is right now, from my estimation, is... For most TOs, I think they'll exist in the same position, Chuck, that you just said, right? Which is most TOs will be like, yeah, sure. They're all, all these armies were came out at the same time. They're all probably tested together. They're all basically the, the same, have the same amount of support. So sure, like, okay, they're not allowed at official GW events, but most other TOs will allow them, right? The question is just exactly what you said, Brendan, which is how long does that last if 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 they don't get touched at all, as they've said right now, they don't plan to touch them for ever. We'll see what ever actually means. Um, but and, and the the sub corollary question there is, how fast do the regular rules change and get updates and have new books or supplements or yada 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 updates, whatever, right? Because the in AOS, these PDFs did not last very long, about six months, right, before they were. And and that was during a very poor, awful launch of nonsense where they had no idea what they were doing for a good solid year into the game. And so realistically here, I think they have hopefully a much cleaner, clearer launch plan as to what they're trying to do here. Uh, but it just is like, what do we get? Two years, six months, three years? How, how fast does change come? That's what it's going to be determined. For now, I would say, hey, they're going to be perfectly playable. Let's enjoy that while it lasts. And if there's demand, if people enough people are playing them, if they hear that, then perhaps they respond. That's, I think, what we can it, say. It, and what I've said on my shows, too, is, you know, definitely offer that feedback that you would you want to see them exist. But make sure you do it with kindness, kindness in your heart. Um, like... I, I think they will listen if enough of us speak up. They're like, no, we actually want these armies. Please, can we have them? 
but don't be berating them. Be like, oh, I'm gonna now burn my dark elf army again because they don't exist in two years' time. Like, like just you know, offer the feedback, do it with kindness, but also right now, just play. It. If you have an army and you want to play it, just play it. You're fine. Yeah, I think they I didn't bring back. Really dark wanted elves. to see that. Yeah. Sorry, Vince. Go ahead. No, I was just say. I think they didn't bring back dark elves specifically to spite death, holy death. I know everybody's saying, oh, the reason. <laughs> These models aren't here is because of, you know, like AOS and it's the two different game companies. And it is there's two different studios basically living in the same company and they compete financially with each other and blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the internal politics of what's going on. I'm sure like somebody made a decision. I don't agree with it. But here we are. I'm going to start the conspiracy theory that the reason the Dark Elves didn't get brought back was simply to spite Death Holy Death <laughs> since he burned his Dark Elf army. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, let's make sure that guy's decision stays correct. <laughs> I I had to call out real quick. When I first saw that, I was like, oh man, that's stupid because I was a high elf player during that time. Sure. Now my doc focus, I, I, I that video will pop up and I see like witch elves burning. I'm just like, oh no. Oh right. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Let's switch gears here and go back to the game itself. Uh, I will say that my high level thought is the pace of the game the internal pace, I mean, like, actually playing the game, will be much more measured and careful. This is not a first-turn, lots-of-action game. Not only are you, your the way your units are moving, you need to be more careful, you need to be setting up things. Counter charges and stuff like that are very important. Your positioning is very, very, very important. And units don't tend to just smash the other unit off the table unless it's, like, you know, hitting some dumb chaff thing that's literally there and meant to die and it's getting hit by a hammer. Of course it's going to die. But, um, you know, it's a, I think it's going to rely a lot more on, like, push and pull and back and forth, a lot of, like, breaking and, and moving and giving ground and then rallying and, and, uh, and or fleeing and rallying or whatever it is, stuff like that. Uh, I don't know. Brendan, what do you think? I'm going to start with you this time. Yeah, I, you, you talk about measured, um, in terms of decision making, I think the game is going to play quite a bit faster once people get their hands around it um, in terms like you obviously have to understand that if you're flipping through the book, the whole game, like it's, sure. it's going to take, it's going to take a minute, but making the assumption that this is a person who understands the rules of their army and the mechanics of the game. I, I got the impression from these battle reports that it, it feels like things just kind of go quicker. The um, things resolve themselves a little bit fat. Like the combats don't take forever, right? right. You know, you're, right. you're going to do your thing here. Your opponent's going to do your thing. You're going to stack up your numbers. You're going to go, okay, uh, you win by this much. Roll the dice. Here's the result. What do you want to do? Right. And it felt really clean. And it felt like that those actions resolving themselves as quickly as they do just kind of move the game along. And it feels like something is happening. Right. Um, and maybe it's the perception that something is happening, that it feels like the game is you know, is, is playing faster. Cause I have stuck in my head, you know, you know, my 60 block of empire swordsman with the Griffin banner in the dead middle of the table there for eight combats in a row and nothing happens. Uh, and you're hoping that one of these flanks breaks and you can just roll through the side of them. It, it feels like a lot of the stuff on the table is, is moving quicker uh, and that things are just, happening and that's yeah, yeah. that was really nice to see uh here's a fun it, you 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 whenever when chuck turned off his camera and came back it reloaded you and you moved and now you've frozen in a very funny looking position <laughs> yeah. so it's it's oh. very funny Sorry. uh if you turn your camera on and off you 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 you, you can like you can you can get out of your very surprised face you're in right now <laughs> um at any rate the uh. yeah here's a fun thing during the entire game we played, so Brendan and I played a game this last Saturday to get ready to, to, you know, and both in prep for the show and because we wanted to play the game. And only one time did I roll more than 10 dice. Okay. That was pretty cool. And like that actually just makes the game go a lot faster. We talk a lot about what makes AOS take time. And one of the things that makes AOS take for freaking ever often is just the dice rolling. It's just making like 32 million attacks. It's one of the reasons I love playing Sons of Batman again is because like, uh, you know, I'm just basically rolling like four to six dice, right? Like hit, hit, wound, good, done, next. Mm -hmm. 
It's fast. When you have to pick up a unit and be like, okay, each of these guys has three attacks. It's, I get to attack with, let's see, 32 of them. Okay, that's 96 attacks. And, I've got you these know, other weapon profiles. And... Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Like that, it just takes a long time to roll through all those, find the hits, separate them out. Oh, on a six, this special thing happens. Okay, blah, 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 right? Yeah, whatever. All right. So here's my next high level thought. Uh, many of the worst sins from 8th edition, if you played 8th edition, are nowhere to be found here. So they've, like, a lot of these things have been re removed from the game because they weren't in older editions. They were just, like, secondary consequences of the way that they wrote 8th edition. So this is things like railroading or six dice scaling, where meaning just you you throw six dice to the biggest spell and hope to wreck your your enemy's entire unit and and call it a game. Um, character loading, character loading means just like the entire front rank of my uh, my unit is characters, right? So you have to split up all your attacks individually, and they're all tough as nails. And uh, I never lose combat res, right? Because you're basically doing nothing, whereas I'm chopping into your normal dudes. Um, like all that stuff has been re-eliminated from the game. Like it was, it was, it was never part of the way the game worked in older sort of middle hammer editions. And, and there you go. But uh, Vince, I want my 40 white lions, Alario and mage and BSB with banner of the world dragon. And I want to miscast and I want to kill your whole army. And then I want to roll two up and ignore it on all my models, please. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we call some high elf BS right there. Ah, oh, you're bringing me back. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, I mean like a lot of that stuff is gone, right? Which is yeah. good. It's a very good thing. Uh, I don't know. Anything to add? Brendan, any additional thoughts on that one? The, the Skaven slave, uh, murder bus being gone. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. one of the big changes is, is the difference between, you know, marching formation and just your regular fighting formation and that there are things you just can't do. And that's um, it back to the point of it feeling really intentional. Um, and like you said earlier, I'm sure we'll find the all, all game systems have weak points. I'm sure, sure. we will find the places that break them. Um, but some of the stuff that was familiar in terms of being really unfun um to play against just it, it, you just can't the rules don't let you so that that was really refreshing to see and mm -hmm. you know it, it it feels like just a rank and flank where your stuff has some level of balance versus what you're what you're opposed to yep yep absolutely my last high level thought is if you are a fan of old or middle hammer this may very well be an a, something you should really look into um, it's much heavier than those, especially like fourth or fifth. As I said, I started in, in fourth, um, late fourth. So much like your experience with sixth, where like I started right at the end of fourth and then went into to fifth edition. Um, though many of us were still playing with fourth edition books for a long time, obviously. Um, but it feels quite clean. It's like a cleaned up, expanded version of sort of middle hammer is really what it felt like to me. As I said, with a little bit of like, uh, sprinkles of middle earth strategy battle game put on top there just for, for funsies. So don't forget about the sprinkling of like the modern game design, like the magic phase yeah, yeah. changes. Like it's 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 a nice blend of all of it. Like it, as a BS high elf player from eighth edition, do I miss the magic phase? Do I miss always strikes first? Yes, but I know why they're gone, and I'm not upset by it. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. All right. Let's leave high level thoughts behind. And now let's go here to things we love. All right. Uh, all right. Things we love or things to love. I don't know if it's we love. This, this is, look, I wrote this list. Okay, I wrote this. So they can all disagree with me. Maybe this is something they love. I don't know. <laughs> but I, in my mind, this is things to love. Okay. So... I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to fire these off and then, and then you guys can react once I'm done. I'm just going to, I'm going to blow through this quickly. Here we go. New magic. Uh, this is a bold swing, right? Not having a magic phase and instead magic integrating into sort of every phase. It can be kind of annoying at the, at be the first to remember what casts win and under what conditions you can do it. And can I do it if I'm in combat or against somebody who's in combat and something like that. But once you kind of get it under your, once you get that, 
that muscle memory established, honestly, it feels pretty great. Um, having magic be interwoven throughout all of the phases of the game and being kind of present makes the game feel more magical. Like, it makes you feel like you're playing in a magical fantasy world. Like, people commented it feels like that this is a more low, gritty game. Ironically, because of the way they've interspersed magic, this feels more magical than any previous edition of Warhammer because, like, mages are always ever-present doing things, right? Now, the flip side of that is, like, the spells aren't immediately impactful. There's no, like, oops, I killed your whole unit, okay? Oh, well, thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is Probably great. a good thing. I mean, unless maybe, like, occasionally a damage spell could kill, like, a chaff unit. That actually happened in our game. I had, like, two carrion floating out somewhere, and he killed them with a spell. It was like, okay. <laughs> That's, like, four wounds with no save. You know, it wasn't that hard of a lift, right? <laughs> um, but, but my point is, is that for the most part, they're not game-winning on their own, but they're impactful in a like a a material way and proper use of them in the phases leads to outcomes they become part of your overall strategy just like moving is just like you know where you have your your troops set up what your counter charge is like using the right spells the right time becomes a really interesting part of that that overall tactical play and i think it feels really good okay uh, so that's, that's my first one. I lied and said, well, I was tell gonna why it's I'm not going to blow through them. I'm going to let y'all react. What do you think? What do you think about new magic? Good. Yeah. yeah. The, so, yeah. so the, the thing that, the thing that you're talking about in, in terms of being impactful and, and knowing when to do stuff, our game really evolved as the game went on because you and I started to figure out the spells in our, in our pockets had different purposes. Yep than maybe what we what we thought they did at first pass. And you drop the the Tomb King Vortex spell that dropped bravery in an AoE and, and as we were resolving combat we went, oh. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. this is like this is a big deal. Back. Like you know the like yeah the the placement of it, the timing of it was was key and critical and and it was and it was a big deal. Um I love that we were always doing something with our wizards and yep. it feels like if you're playing against an army that will be magic heavy, even if you don't have a ton of wizards, you're always going to be able to do something about it because nothing felt worse in, in fantasy when you got over to the magic phase and you were playing against Zinch and they had right level four and they took their six dice or against elves Boom, chuck it, super big spell, your initiative zero, uh, pit of shades, sick, you know, you're going to lift 50 of these, and that, like, that's it. Um, yep. The interaction back and forth was cool, the limited to 2d6 plus your caster level, both directions was cool. Yep. Um, it never really came up in terms of miscasting on the, on the dispel, but there being risk in every action you take is is a great mechanical add to, to the game. It, it means that sometimes you're just going to go... Look, this wizard's on one wound left. I, it's unlikely that I unbind this, and I, I cannot risk the the you know the chance that I'm I'm going to see this blow up. And then you also have a tool in your pocket where you can throw the unbind without your wizard being the risk. Yep, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely agreed. And we'll talk about all the you like we're we're going to go phase by phase later on in this present. So don't worry, we will we will do the blow by blow and talk about some of the like things to watch out for and the important elements of each phase and stuff like that. But I wanted to start with the things we love, things we hate, things we're not sure about stuff. Okay, army building. Your army will generally feel like an army. In most cases, unless you want to go truly crazy, you can build your force how you want, especially when you factor in the expando PD armies. Now, I love this. This is this is actually my preferred army building system. I'm just going to go ahead and like say this outright i always i never liked the sort of what we adopted in i think it was like six seventh eighth where they we went to like the uh, zero to this many points you do this thing and you get this many lords and stuff like this this is much more akin the, the way it currently breaks down is by percentages and stuff like that and we'll talk about army building later in detail but this is more like fifth edition like that was how it was percentages you allocated different things and you had like the alternate armies in the back of the book and stuff where you where it changed who fits into what category hence switching around the percentages and stuff like that and that's what the expandopedia armies do as well so for example like if you're really into tomb kings ushabti let's say as i am 
right? Well, then let me tell you all about the mortuary cult, right? Where they suddenly become a core choice. Like, that's great, right? Because now you can have a bunch of Ushapti. And so stuff like that's really meaningful and impactful. You can still build your, your army pretty, pretty uh, interestingly. And I really like the way that it, you can just like swap it out. And being a percentage, I like it as a percentage with the addendum of, you know, one plus. You got to have one or more of these or zero to one or zero to three or something like that also being in there. That's great. I really like this method of army building. Uh, I just think it actually leads to, to a really interesting balance leverage you can pull. Chuck, where are you living on this one? Oh, I, I love it. Um, the Sigmar list building and 40k list building never really did it for me with the current editions. Uh, I, I'm not, a, I, I, I get with Sigmar, like, to, as a comparison point, like, battalions, that's where you want to go into your deep list building tool, but that doesn't fill the same void to me. I, when I went to the Square Base GT at the end of the last year, um, I was the person who happily sat there with a list with 50 to 100 points left, spending hours figuring out where to put those points in. And I feel like that's the case for this list building in this game. Yeah. But with, as you say, the expand of PDA armies, we get that joy of Sigmar where it's just like, hey, here's a thing you love. We've tested this and balanced it in a way that you can actually bring what you like. You can bring that all Bretonian mounted force. You can bring that Shati. And it's going to work just fine. So it's kind of like, you know, the normal game is going to be eat your vegetables, then eat your steak and eat your pudding. Whereas there's still the option to get more of the pudding at the end uh, in, in a, a much more clean fashion. So I, I, I'm a fan of this list building and I will spend hours in list building. Even in Sigmar, I still spend lots of time list building. That's where I probably spend most of my hobby time. And in this style of game, with the granularity of it, I will spend even more time with it. So I, I'm a fan that we have that granularity plus also the expandopedia to give us that sigmar feel where it's just like i like this thing i can take this thing let's go yep robert t the expandopedia armies are our little name for there it is yeah. arcane, for, journals. Uh, arcane, the arcane journals. journals yes in these there are uh additional armies like here we go the tomb kings of Kemori mortuary cult which changes your percentage like what fits into what percentages and where like it changes who's in what category and stuff like that um, I also just want to take a quick moment here to, 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 to just really celebrate something else, Chuck. Are you ready for this? I want this I'm to ready. come back. Brendan, I think you're going to be with me on this. So in the Expandopedia armies, so for example, uh, yeah, there we go. In this, you'll notice here, well, you can't read it, obviously. This is very small text to you watching at home. But up here in the character section, it says, Zero to one Tomb Prince or Arch Necrotect per a thousand points. Arch Necrotect? That's not a thing in Ravening Hordes. That's not an existing unit. I can't go to the store and buy an Arch Necrotect. But when I flip forward in the book here, it, here why, why, what do I find but the rules for an Arch Necrotect, right? And down here at the bottom, it says, representing this unit in your games. Painted in rich and vibrant colors or mounted upon a scenic base, an arch necrotect can easily be distinguished from a humble necrotect. What I love about that, and this, they do this throughout here, you mentioned the tomb guard chariots, where you can put tomb guards on chariots, and they're representing it in your game as, I don't know, man, put a couple tomb guard on a chariot, go nuts, right? <laughs> like, they treat you like an adult uh, and say, here's some cool ideas for units, no, we don't make specific models for these, but we trust that you're an adult and can figure out how to take a tomb guard and go, hold on, I've got a chariot and a tomb guard. A chariot and a tomb guard. Hmm. <laughs> Bloop. Oh my God! <laughs> right? And it's just like, like they just trust you to be an adult, and they don't limit the what the units that they can create to only the models they can make. They let you. They 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 play. They it's like some mm -hmm. jazz, right? They're just they're playing with the ideas of the thing, and I'm here for that a thousand percent, man. Yep. You know when when I, I, certainly when I was coming up in Warhammer, you'd open your book and there'd be things in the core book that they didn't that didn't exist. They never made models for some of those things. I say there's multiple uh, dark elf characters when I because the last year I spent completing my 8th edition armies, which meant kitbashing heroes, especially in the Dark Elf line, that they never made models for. There was no even art right. pictures. It's just, hey, 
this is the this is the uh, executioner hero. Here's his story. Have fun. And Have like, fun. Okay, yeah, go nuts. Right, just grab my bits and go to town. Yeah, yeah. Like I love it. I really love it. I cannot explain. And it, honestly, like. I wish AOS trusted us to be adults. I really do. But they don't want to put things in a book that doesn't have a matching kit. And I just think the game's worse for it. Like, I was so excited when I saw that. I am going to roll some venerable shop tea. I am going to bring out an arch necrotech. Like, that mortuary cult is where I'm living. Let me just tell you right now, I'm here for it. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, Brendan, anything else that we missed on that one? Anything else you wanted to add in? No, I mean, I'm building a beast lord on Razor Gore Chariot after our game, so... You know, a, a model that doesn't exist, and um, very pleased that I exists happen to have the heart. right spare this right spare bits to make it to make it feel pretty cool. Nice, nice. Uh, I love it. Um, yes. Uh, so, universal special rules is my next item here. They do a good job of making the unit feel like the unit, but dot dot dot. We'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> Wait until the next slide. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, it is true. Like when, you know, my Tomb Guard example from earlier in the show where my Tomb Guard have 14 different special rules that they have to heed and pay attention to, you know, the downside of that is it's 14 insane rules. The upside of that is, yeah, man, in the end, they do feel like Tomb Guard. Like the combination of stats and all those rules really does make them feel like the thing. And when I looked through a lot of the units in a lot of the the books, I would look at their sort of combination of rules and be like, yeah, okay. I see how we're getting that feel. Like these feel like my image of the thing. There's very little Ludo narrative dissonance here, which is nice. Uh, Chuck, where are you living on this one? Any, any, anything you yeah, to disagree no. with? I, I, I see I know the pros and cons, uh, having listened to you, Vince, about universal special rules. What I do like about them in general is if you're playing those Tomb Guard and you have to learn those fourteen universal special rules, well guess what? You now know them. So whenever they come sure. against you, you understand what they are. That's the that's the benefit. Um I, I like universal special rules, but I also see potential downsides. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I'm 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 over i'm 70 percent a fan of them over not there you go that's fair brendan sure. anything else to add here no not really i i think chuck summed up you know this pretty well it's it's a it's a double-edged sword but you know it's it's not supposed to be a an uncomplicated game i don't think yeah indeed don't worry we will return to this one in just a moment uh because i'm still not a fan of usrs uh, but I like them here. I both like them and hate them. That's part of the problem with them. Like most things in game design, nothing's all bad or all good. All right. New movement rules. Very clean when combined with unit types. You have to think ahead. Your movement really matters as it should. Love this. I am such a big fan of the new movement rules and how they're implemented, especially when combined with the unit types of like, you've got an open order unit and it's this kind of, of thing and what it allows. And then like you, it's, it's really nice. It makes the units move and act and feel really differently. It gives them really solid roles. It makes you use the pieces in particular ways. I'm here for it. I love it. Like, man, I really dig it. It's nice. They put together a good set of movement rules, and I can't think of anything more important in a rank and flank game like this. Uh, Brendan, I want to start with you here. What, what do you What do you think on this one? Yeah, this was one of my biggest gripes specifically as a beastman player was my army in game should not be behaving so much like most armies we were coming across you're probably the most similar with something like wood elves and they got all the fun movement shenanigans and we got none of them sure. um so much of it being tied to just a couple of universal special rules that that really let you change the way a unit behaves so easily and so quickly in such a small way but balance and offset by different benefits that you gain felt really cool. Um, you know, it's one of the things that after we walked away from, from our game that I was thinking about more and more and more was the difference between closed order, the difference between open order, the difference yep. between skirmishers and how that interacts with the different unit types beyond yep. that. Um, and, and so that I think is really going to shape a lot of people's play experiences because there's a lot of, 
creativity in terms of how you go about playing your game with with those rules at your disposal. It, it's it's so cool. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, my next one here is new combat results. Um, though it is a real challenge to get your head around, which is a barrier of entry. Like, I will openly admit, I had to read this like five times. But I said the same thing about the enhancement system in AOS. And so, you know, I like it's not, no, no game is perfect. Uh, it is a real challenge to get your head around how it works. That being said, it is a great system. Like, I actually really like that they changed the outcome from binary you stay and keep fighting, you break and probably die. Right, like those are sort of the two ways it tended to work in the old in the old way. They Unfortunately, it, yeah, yeah. For, from that to a myriad number of different situations, to you do stay and don't move depending on what happens because there's certain things where you just won't move at all. There, you give ground, which means you pop back a couple inches, and they can choose to kind of pursue and follow up with you, right, and just kind of move back into combat. You break but then rally i don't remember the exact name of it i don't have it right in front of me i'm sorry it's, we'll, we'll look at it later but anyways you you run away and then immediately rally but like you you know you just basically you're like nope nope you nope out of that fall combat. Back, good order yeah fall back in good order thank you very much that's the right thing and uh and then you break and flee right so if that where, where it's traditional ah and you're just you're 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 running right and there's a lot of complexity as to when those things sort of can be modified. Like if you read the base rules, they can also get changed. Like it's a little complicated in base and then it gets a little more complicated when you kind of break different stuff in like unit strength, and things like that. But I really like the, the nature of combat resolution and stuff like that. I think it's really, really interesting. Leadership is really important. Cygnus Maximus says what I've seen in the combat res rules makes me think it really hurts low leadership armies. Is that the case? Keep in mind, most armies do not have amazing leadership. This isn't like AOS where like huge swaths of the game are leadership 10. Like most leaderships suck or and or are being modified by the characters that are in them or within command range of them and stuff like that. So, you know, yes and no. I mean, like most people are actually going to end up around the same-ish um, leadership. It means that like spells that modify leadership and stuff like that are really, really, really powerful um in that they'll, they'll they'll move odds just a little bit again it's like it's just moving those odds around you're just moving those odds and creating the chance creating outs creating opportunities those kinds of things all right brendan i'll go to you here again first what do you think about the new combat result thing uh, i i loved them it it really i want to say unexpected is that's not the right word um but it, it resolved itself in, in a way that I really wasn't planning to. I, I kind of approached it to an older game of Warhammer Fantasy, and we started to get into combat. It's like, oh, oh, no. Right. It's, yeah. it, this, is, this is not going the way that I thought it was. And you know, stuff was breaking and fleeing where it was a combat that both you and I, um, basically at the point of charge, we said like, oh, like this is this is good for you, or... Oh, right. I really like being here. And that combat almost certainly when we got to the res was like, oh no, this was bad. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it was great too. Cause it happened back and forth. Like Brendan charged me and I was like, oh no, I lost. I'm dead. Right. And then it turned out like, oh, actually we, it was okay. We kind of turned even. And then I had a good counter charge and he was like, all right, well, you know, still okay. These are very kill a unit. And then like the res just went way in my favor and, and it was like, whoa, no, this is terrible. But then in chasing him down, I brought myself into, into range of like his, one of his big kill units and then hit me. And I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. And then I was like, nope, not fine. The oh, entire no. unit is crumbling to dust. Oh God, we've chosen wrong. <laughs> like, and it was just so back and forth. It was really great. Um, so yeah, I really, I yeah, really I, liked I, it. I just love the, the thought put into it the fact that you're not stuck in combat, I think is probably the biggest benefit yeah. to me. Like, can you still get back in combat very quickly? Yes. But just the possibility of you getting out of a combat that was going nowhere, because those were the worst part of the old fantasy games where you're just stuck yeah. there and grinding away at nothing like, and hoping for your opponent to roll 12 because they have a leadership 10 and hopefully right. their BSB is far enough away. Yep. They have the possibility to just fall back in good order and then have some options, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. 
And then, as I said here, my last thing to love is, honestly, the speed of the game is nice. Units don't make a lot of attacks. Combat results matter. How you attack matters. Your movement matters. All those kinds of things. I found it to be, as I said, there was one one time in the game where I rolled more than 10 dice at a time. And that was 14, by the way. Because Brendan got into, like, he took, <laughs> what did you take, like, three units into a chap unit of archers? Because that was sort of the only choice. Yeah. And those poor archers. Oh, those got poor mulched. skeleton archers. It was, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just obviously regeneration saves because they had gotten hit by so many, so many units and they're like initiative two. <laughs> uh, those poor guys. They did their job. They died so that others could live. Um, but yeah, I mean, like overall, I think it's nice. Okay. Cool. Good. Uh, but boom. Let's do things to hate. Uh, you think, hey, Vince, whoa, I thought you said you loved this game, or you liked this game, or you're enjoying it, or something. You said something to that effect. How do you have a hate list? Look, if you don't like hate, or you can make it things I don't like, like, whatever, okay? We're just, this is the internet, so everything's really strong, all right? It's either best movie ever, worst movie ever, all right? Get off my back. Okay, so here we go. These are the things that I don't like very much about the game. I will say, on balance, I like the game. I need to keep saying this so people hear me. But just like with AOS, I like AOS a lot, and I hate battle tactics. There are things in that game I hate, too. Okay, here we go. Uh, so many much rules. 250 pages of rules. Yes, that is the actual rules. The book is 325 pages. Basically, 75 of those pages are lore. 250 of those pages are rules. I, I, technically, it's probably more like 246 because there's a couple of full art pages in there, but whatever. Uh, rules are scattered everywhere, not always where you would think. Finding and referencing things is often a challenge, as A will lead to B will lead to C, and so on and so forth. Like, you look up this thing, it sends you to the this place that sends you to the unit type, which then references another rule, so you've got to go here. It's like, okay, got it. So my, my heavy cab do this, which grants them this, which has this, so I get this thing. It's like, all right. You know, that kind of stuff. All right. Okay, this one I will blow through real quick and then I'll let you guys react rather than hit you each time. Here we go. USRs. There are so many. They've said there are 75. This is a lie. This is a straight up lie. Uh, there are 77 base and there are 13 or so more for troop type special rules because each troop type has its own special rules. Then there are modifications of those for each weapon. So, for example, a weapon might grant a special rule, but only under X conditions, like only in the first round of combat or only when you charge or only when you are charged or only on a Tuesday. And then each army introduces about seven to ten more universal special rules. So that is to say, like, the High Elves have their own set and Tomb Kings have their own set and so on and so forth. So when you're done, you have about 150, quote, universal. Real big... Real, real big bunny ears on that one. Special rules. At that point, you're just hiding information. Like, this is why I don't like them. I really wish they were just more concisely written out. I wish they'd put in a cheat sheet that had them all. But they can't, because there's too many. Uh, it's just a problem. And, like, some of them probably don't need to exist, is my honest answer. Like, boy, oh boy, do some of them not need to exist. Okay. Um, army building. I remember when I had that on the things I love... I, it's here too. The same with USRs. Um, get ready to fret over the details. I hope you don't suffer from choice paralysis as each unit is packed with options and bought individually and most champions can even take magic items. So it's just like, I have your sorry cheaty. I'm not going to say what that is a reference to, but if you know, you know. Um, and, you know, like the, the, the nature of this is such that like, Buying each model individually, how many exact Tomb Guard do I want? Are they drilled? Are, do they have Nehekaran Phalanx? Did I give them Halberds? All this kind of stuff. And they're like, honestly, simpler. There are some units that are way worse when you come to the options. You'll look at it, it's just a page where it's like, brap. Like, okay, these guys can do everything. <laughs> they have five different weapons they could choose to buy and yada, 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 yada. Um... Don't look if you if you have choice paralysis. Don't look at the the I think they're called I don't know what they're called like bandits or something. But they're villains from old uh, the old fourth edition Bretonia book. That's what they are. Um, in in the uh, the border princes, uh, Bretonia oh, the exiles. Uh, yeah, in the exile army. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. back in like fourth or fifth edition Bretonia, I think maybe it was even older than that. Maybe it was third edition. God, I don't remember. Long time ago, 
long ago before the dawn of man um there was a the bretonians when they were much 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 meaner and much more french um had a unit called vilaines okay which was basically like that's that's where the word comes from it's like bandits on the roadside and uh they were just like a sort of catch-all unit of like dudes who would rob you on the road and they you know, had pistols and rapiers and stuff like that it was a cool unit right and they ended up falling out of bretonia when it became a little bit different and solidified its sort of imagery but i love that they brought it back that's somebody who has a deep love of the history of bretonia so at any rate those guys have fifty thousand different options and then finally war machines especially stone throwers still bad still bad i cannot explain how bad stone throwers still are now given my screaming skull catapult round one misfired so then didn't and rolled a two or three or something so it didn't shoot in round two and then round three it got charged yay or no, round three, everybody was in range. Everybody was within 12 inches of me. <laughs> Every unit he had that wasn't in combat was within 12 inches of me. That's what it was. And I was like, great. Hooray. Great. Yay. I mean, as it he is, it. stone throwers only have a 27%-ish chance to hit. That can vary some depending on kind of how big the unit is you're aiming at and whatever. That's a terrible hit percentage chance. Uh, again, it depends on how big the unit is and drift and stuff like that. But But whatever. Cannons, though, still amazing, and the one thing they kept here that I am very sad about is 10 from the back. 10 from the back, still a thing. <laughs> uh, this should have been gone. I don't know what the right answer is. Go back to guess range, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, like, I hate that 10 from the back still exists. It's awful. I hate that it's that cannons still do what they do. Um, they're really strong. They're probably the strong war machine. All right, those are my things to hate. Uh, okay, gentlemen, what about... You don't have to agree with my list. You can respond to my list, or you can say anything else you've got that might be bothering you or things that were maybe... You don't even have to hate it. just might be it's sort of a... Maybe a bit of a, a thorn in your paw, as it were. Uh, Chuck, start with you. You're a very positive guy, I'll say, so I'll start with you. I'll say, I, I, I'm looking at this list I went through, and this isn't things I hate. This is things I love, part two. <laughs> um, <laughs> So many rules, 250. I love that. I don't mind the A to B to C. What I do hate is bad index. That can go on things I hate. Yeah, oh, the index, the index yeah. is terrible. Yeah. Yes. And and that 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 only comes up when you play a game with a book. I know you two have. I have not yet, but I've heard that it's not the best index. So I will put the index on things I hate, but not the rules. Uh, the the universal index, special rules? Agreed. Pause. Let me, let me answer a thing in the chat yeah, real sorry. quick. Some yeah. people don't know 10 from the back. Multiple people ask me what's 10 from the back. Okay. Here's 10 from the back. You ready? This is your unit. Yeah? They're in their little box. Okay, I have a cannon. It's over here. When you when you shoot a cannon, you're going to roll the uh, artillery dice once and add that to... You're, like, you're going to pick a point. Okay? On the on the ground. You pick some point on the Which ground the cannon four, can see. 6, 10? Misfire? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Yeah, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 misfire. Two, four, six, so eight. the first thing you do when you, when, you, when you shoot a cannon is you pick a point on the ground. Then you're going to roll the artillery dice... And you're going to add the result of that artillery dice to where, the, like, to the point you picked on the ground. Okay, so like, let's say you picked here, and you roll a four, you're going to go four inches forward from that spot. Yeah. So this is then actually where the cannonball impacts. If you roll a misfire, then you have some misfire or whatever. But otherwise, it, it impacts here. Then you're going to roll the artillery dice again. Let's say you roll an eight. That means it bounces. The cannonball bounces from here to here. So from the initial roll to the second roll. Okay. So it covers this eight inches. Everything under that second line gets hit by the cannon. All right. Mathematically, what that means is that the correct answer of how to fire a cannon when you're targeting this unit is say, I'm going to pick the center of the unit 10 inches from the back. That's it. I'm not going to pick anything else. I'm not going to look at anything else. I'm not doing any measurements. It's just 10 from the back. Because mathematically, whatever 10 inches is forward, that means on the average of the two dice plows the thing through this unit. So that's 10 from the back continue uh universal special rules kind of plays into the first part i don't mind universal special rules so i'm not going to rehash that army building um as i said i love that last 100 to 110 points in fantasy lists where i am agonizing over the magic items and i love that there's more options for it now so it, it doesn't bother me but i can see where it will bother some people um as far as war machines go Cannons 10 from the back. I, once again, I don't know the right answer, but also it's only was it D3 plus one now, not D6. So my Frost Phoenix isn't getting turned off turn one by just exploding into ice shards. 
Uh, and if a monster or a thing, monsters cavalry, correct me, I can't recall, gets hit by a cannon, it just stops bouncing. So uh, there it's is not monsters, it's, to, uh, yeah, monsters or behemoths. Yes, I know it's monsters, behemoths. Okay, so there is ways to screen Correct. from cannons. So I, 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 I'm not gonna say anything about stone throwers. I'm a cannon guy when I played my dwarfs, but I think cannons are toned down a little bit more than they used to be. Is it easy to hit with them still? Yes, I won't deny that. But uh, no, I, I, I don't hate anything so much on this list other than indexes. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah, your your what the one cannon won't kill your frost phoenix. I would point out, however, that dwarves can very easily bring six cannons. So I don't know about your luck with the six well, cannon barrage. Are, are we? Do we want to open up a can of worms of two thousand points versus nineteen ninety nine? It'll oh, be discussed geez. later. It'll be discussed later. That's okay. for that's for a later point. Uh, Brendan, what's your what's your what's your what's your items? Hit me here. I, I Chuck nailed it on the head. The index is terrible. Um, this was one of the biggest problems when you and I were playing. Was a situation came up. I, I went to the index and thought to myself, boy, dispel feels like a word that <laughs> is, is going to come up and people will have questions about. Yep. And so I went to the index and I went to D and like it goes like, duh, 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 duh. and then it's like, whoop, like, okay, well, I, I guess we'll, we'll find something else. And then, you know, something else came up and I went. Yeah, like overrun or whatever. Like, yeah, sure. that. Or, like, I don't know what it was specifically, but it was just another like, yeah, that. Like, I don't know where that is. I a very common than... game word in a situation that's going to happen many times. Yes, <laughs> yes. I've <laughs> I've spent eight minutes with these rules. Um, let's you know, let's see what it, where it is. Mm, one of them. If... One of them. Like, there's not even a letter for <laughs> like the word I was looking for, and I went. You've got to be kidding me! And if there's if there's any comp that needs to happen from the community, it's write the r real index, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. R really, what they need is a better one of these. This is one of the things. So they this this is like the the you get this thing, but you're gonna see it in more detail in a minute because I used it for to guide our later discussion. But you get this, which is you know one, two, three, four pages. It's like your cheat sheet, right? Comes with the book. The problem is four pages was not enough for a cheat sheet. It just wasn't. The cheat sheet needs to be like probably eight pages, maybe 12, something like that. And they could have done that. Like there's no reason you couldn't have a foldable couple pages or whatever, right? Um, but I get it. it like then it, then it couldn't be made like this, which is printed out and then folded, right? Yes, yeah, folded. Uh, um, like it would have required a, more, a much more expensive process. And so... You know, that's what they really need is a better cheat sheet with more of the common things on there. Like and, after and the I game, Brendan, like, when you and I were like, you were like, hey, did you know you get an extra plus one combat res for this? And I'm like, no, where's that at? And it's like, it's not, there's a list here of things that add to combat res and we were just following it. And I was like, why isn't it on the list? And you're like, well, it must be under other bonuses. <laughs> <laughs> Helpful. The, right. And if anyone that, out there in the comments, is, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go for it. Go for it. I'll say if anyone out there in the comments is talking about the uh, cheat sheet reference for 8th edition that we all have, and I have a bunch of down here to my left where it was two pages, that's useful when we're at the end of the game and we all know most of the rules already. Right. It's more of the, how does that chart work again? So so it's not, it, it needs to be more robust at the start for sure. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing about that other part in that combat res that drove me nuts is Vince, I, I read that rule book front to back mm -hmm. i mean i i fell asleep in a chair reading it at one point the amount of other combat <laughs> resolutions uh-huh boy in the core rules is zero uh yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. so um you know so there there was a bit of a, a learning curve for for us there the the other thing that I I really didn't like as I was going through it, you know, I don't know that it classifies under hate, um, sure. but I I wasn't I wasn't fond of it. You know, we we played a game and I got the I got the chance to sit through and and read these rules. Um, was how easy it is to get a small thing wrong that impacts the entire game, and 
thankfully in in our game that really didn't come up um right. you know some of the interactions that we had would have been canceled out by some other rule and we we idiots savanted our way into you know, <laughs> right. largely the right answer yeah. um but there's a number of things in there where it doesn't take much to resolve this in the way that it kind of clicks in your head and then you go do it. And at the end of it, you're like, Oh my God, my unit shouldn't have done that, which caused this to happen, which caused that to happen. And, and there's no way of resolving it at that point because you, right. you cannot figure out what occurred. And, and maybe I'm thinking in age of Sigmar that it's a little bit easier to say, well, this happened and this happened and this happened, but if this didn't happen, then only this thing doesn't happen. I, I feel like that cascade isn't as present in, in Age of Sigmar as right. as much as fantasy is. And, and that's part of how the game is supposed to work, but man, there are some real tiny things that, that can set off that avalanche. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. All right, good stuff. Let's go to my things TBD. So this is going to take a long time. Like, not only is there a lot here to, to ingest. I mean, this is a huge amount of content that's dropped, right? Not just the core rules, but all the armies and then the two expandopedias. And, you know, it's just like, then the PDFs will be coming too. Like, it's just, wah, it's a deluge, right? So some things just haven't had enough play yet. I don't, I don't know. Could turn out to be something I love. Could turn out to be something I don't like. Could turn out to be just something that I'm like, eh, I'm neutral on, right? So this is kind of the list. But it's things that I found interesting. Like, they've got my attention. I just don't know what to think about them yet. Um, so the first one is unit formations, closed order, open order, which is which. Is which. It's not very visually distinct. Like, it's kind of, it is a very relevant thing. Uh, like, it, it matters a lot uh, whether a unit is closed order or open order. Um, matters with terrain and your the rank bonus you can claim and... Uh, like a bunch of stuff and but they look exactly identical yeah um and then skirmishers uh i like the formations like conceptually like when i read the rules i really like them i like the way they've distinguished them them being not visually distinct often is tough like technically you could set a skirmisher unit up in open order and that would be fine like you could just have them all next to each other and so it's it's a little weird um, because it's kind of hard to say. I don't, I'm not sure what that matters. Might matter a lot, might not. There's some small Would you memory. Throw a board on that as well? Uh, maybe. Because it's, it's it, more of a universal now than, than just bring 10 models in a row. Yeah, sure. I mean, it could be, could be, absolutely. Um, memory traps on some things like ambushers, which I'm not sure are worth it at all anyways without special rules. Like I think ambushers might be a super duper trap in the way that they work. Um, but like you roll to see if they're going to come on at a different time than when you actually bring them on. So it's kind of like a, you, it's very different parts of the turn. So you can kind of forget. Um, so that's kind of a thing. Um, everything is initiative and initiative is everything. Uh, and yes, I mean that both, I, I mean, both of those are true. Uh, and I, I like it, I think, but I also, am not sure what that means because I read the rules for Swordmasters and then I clenched in my seat and raised up about it an inch off the off my chair. Uh, <laughs> so in a world where everything's my, my initiative, you're waiting. Yeah, uh huh. Super fast <laughs> elves are scary. Um, no fighting back if the fighting rank is dead, um, and the fighting rank in general. That's that's really interesting to me. That's a return to the Warhammer Fantasy again that I knew that I came up on right, which was like you step up people don't fight that was actually a pretty recent thing um and so like having if you know if the front rank gets wiped out and there's no supporting attacks or whatever then that's it the unit doesn't fight right so like you're done <laughs> so next this, this is very step up is very no step up is very new to me as an eighth edition player that's sure. where i cut my teeth but did you catch on the uh potential first faq we need the uh, spearmen. Oh, okay. Go for it. Yeah, explain. Yes. So, so if you're stepping up from the second rank into the first rank, is the ones that can't fight. Right. But if you're stepping up from the third rank to the second rank, that's not what the rules say. And if you're spears, you can fight. So, so if do you, you have... still get to make your supporting attacks. Yeah. So yeah. Rules so there right is... now. Yes. <laughs> so it's like FAQ time. Already, we're already there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So there's um, there's something where it addresses that in a very small way, where like. 
those excess kills can impact your supporting attacks. I don't remember the language for it specifically, but I, I agree there's a level of clarification that, that is needed on that because um, my first pass at it was similar to yours, Chuck, where I was like, well, but no, I, I think that they also mean that this is what they want to happen here. Right. 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 Yeah. And then at the same time, I like the concept of the fighting rank where, like, the whole rank gets to pitch in. Right. Um, that is to say, so like to make this more real for everybody, um, unit, yeah, single character or something, something smaller hits it right here. So let's say it's not in base to base contact with any of these dudes down here, right? Or whatever. Um, it's not really how it works because blah, blah, blah. But I just, I'm making an example. Basically, if there's people who are outside of base to base contact in any way, they still pitch in, but they never make more than one attack. Which is a really interesting thing for like monstrous cavalry and sort of monstrous uh, monsters in general, trolls, you know, things like that. Um, because those guys pack a lot of attacks. And so, you know, suddenly reducing them to potentially one attack because you got like one character into one guy in the middle who might be tough enough to withstand that one troll or something. It's maybe an interesting tactic. Like there could be a, a role here for sort of loner things. I'm not sure. So that's not bad. It's just an interesting thing. Um, magic items. There are a lot and the books add more and they all have points. Uh, are we going to end up in the, these are the five good ones situation? Like always, I don't know yet. Can't say I looked through my magic items. Most of there, there are many that I thought about taking, but I don't know enough about the game yet to really know what's good or bad. So that remains a big TBD. And then army balance, who even knows at this point, nobody knows enough to actually know, that's just a giant TBD. Anyone talking about, you know, this army is overpowered or this army is underpowered. I mean, like, come on, man. Get out of here. Yeah. I've spent the past days since Saturday consuming as much content as possible. And every content creator has a very different... Who's going to be the best right now? And even while they're saying that, they, even, they go, I don't know. This is what I feel. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, like... I'm not trusting anyone's gut at this point. There's too many rules. There's too many new things. There's too much nuance, right? Like, Brendan, your whole story about the High Elves versus the Beastmen in that battle report, right? Because, like, I read the High Elf rules, and I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> but, you know, like, but I, but I think there's probably built-in limitations there, and if I played them, it would feel different because of the of, of the, the way that the game's constructed. So, you know, there we go. Does any, do you guys have any TBD items, like things that have caught your interest, but you're not sure how to feel about them yet? Uh, my, honestly, for me, the big one. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. Um, yeah. So my my biggest one is is the first one is is the formations, the the way things move, and the way all that is going to interact with each other. Um, a close order heavy infantry unit is at, at the core of your army is going to be a thing that's really tough to to deal with, and um, the way that it works with getting flanked is that might actually be a unit that you might throw on the outside, and that the different kinds of units have different minimum requirements for what you need for ranks. And so, you know, most people running five across or three across for, you know, the bigger stuff, but some of them require five, some of them require four, some of them require three. And the way that that steps and changes, I, I think will be interesting um, to see how people choose and use and manipulate all of that. But I don't really know what all that looks like right now. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. For me, it's it's the step up, getting used to that. Um, in the context of the rules, it seems like it, it makes sense, but getting used to that as a player is going to be very interesting. Um, but uh, I mean, that, that that's probably my biggest one is the TBDs. Like, how does step up really function based upon my world as a high elf player? Because yep. you speed of always strikes first. I could just I, I could charge or be charged and don't care. I'm going to just probably win this combat if I have the right units. But now, yeah. now you're you know, on initiative. Yeah. Stat change, initiative's much more important, and also charge ranges are much less, you know, broad. So like that's my t TBDs. But that's you know is that it, that's just skill expression that we'll have to work through. Yeah, I I like it's interesting because. You know, I was thinking it through and I was like, all right, well, those sword masters are basically initiative seven with their great swords, right? Which is very fast. But at the same time, there's lots of spells that crack initiative down. 
Uh, and, you know, if those those dudes get charged, you know, the enemy is going to be plus three initiative, plus four if they get charged in the flank. It doesn't take much to where suddenly those great swords aren't fighting first anymore, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, wiping out a couple of those boys and suddenly it's yeah, no fighting back, right? And, and resolution tips against them real hard. So, yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> it's interesting. Okay. Cool. Uh, Keith Rogers also said, is it, uh, is the entire Tomb Kings book still Initiative 2? Not really. Actually, there's quite a lot of, of, like, your basic skeletons and stuff are all Initiative 2, but there's quite a lot of Initiative 3 and even some 4 and stuff in there. So, it's mixed around. I mean, you're not fast, but you're not just that slow. Okay, phase breakdown. B -b 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 breakdown. Uh, so we're going to go through the different phases. And we're going to kind of break them down and talk about the various elements of them. Uh, especially what's changed and the things you should watch out for. Here we go. Uh, let's start with pregame. We're going to pregame it, boys. All right, we're pregaming now. Here we go. Uh, uh, so... Cygnus Maximus, the real question, can Swordmasters hit arrows out of the air again? Um, sort of. They get a six-up ward against um, shooting attacks because they have their because they can spin their swords real fast. Non-magical, just like non, it wasn't eight. Non-magical shooting attacks. That's right. <laughs> Eat it. Okay. Even though it, even they're moving it so quickly, it's magical. But uh, whatever. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about Tomb Kings. I'm just going to use this as a. I'm not. We're not going to go through all the armies. I'm just going to use this to talk about list construction. <laughs> So we mentioned this earlier. This is my, truly, this is the form of list construction I really like, uh, where you have these percentage allocations. So up to 50% can be characters. At least 25% has to be core. Up to 50% can be special. Up to 25% can be rare. And then you have 20% in mercenaries and 25% in allies. My honest answer is I hate mercenaries and allies. I, I really don't like them. Um, I kind of wish they would just get jettisoned and kicked off the roof. Uh, but here we are. Um, the only thing that I do like in allies is your armies of infamy lists that I like, like if it was just you dipping into your own armies of Inf infamy list where it's like, okay, I can reach out my normal tomb Kings army and get an arch necrotect or a venerable, uh, Ushabti or something like that. I'd be fine. I don't really know. Like suspicious does have an impact. It matters. Um, but like allies and mercenaries just really opens the door weirdly to like some, some jank. I traditionally don't like it. I like armies being armies and the armies they are. Um, but I like this form of unit construction. I like this with, with the extra things on, you know, you can see like one plus tomb king or tomb prince. You can have any number of them up to 50%, but you gotta have at least one, one plus high priest or mortuary priest. Again, same story. Right. And, and so on and so forth. So. Cool. Uh, yeah. I mean, anything to say here? This is just list construction. You guys, you guys, are a fan of this? It does lead to the nineteen ninety nine versus two thousand point discussion. Uh, but again, I don't care. Is my answer like whatever, man? It's probably it's probably yeah, nineteen ninety nine is the right answer, honestly. But here we are. I, I like the two levers we get to pull with the percentages and the zero or one plus and all that. Um, I kind of agree with you. I I'm I don't hate allies, but I and mercenaries, but I am concerned about them and the potential game breaking level they pose. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I mean, I can tell you, I'm never taking any of that crap. So there you go. <laughs> None of that stuff is showing in my Tomb Kings army. Get out of here, <laughs> orcs and goblins, warriors of chaos and beastmen. You're not dead. You don't belong here. Okay, we're dead people only. You must be this dead to ride this ride. All right, that's it. <laughs> uh, so there we go. Um, all right, cool. Uh, let's talk about some other pre-game things because I think this is uh, this is all worth a discussion. Um, okay, uh, there are scenarios, six of them in the book. Um, they change sometimes drastically. Your deployment, the conditions for who goes first how long the game lasts, and to a degree, victory conditions. Often through, like, small amounts of extra victory points. Not hugely, but it's there. Um, 
Uh, did you get a chance, Brendan, to look through the... And, I mean, we played, obviously, like, the simple one. We played, like, starter battle plan for babies, basically, right? When we played our game. Because we were like, which one of these is the most simple? That one was what we're doing, right? Line up 24 inches away, kill each other. Sweet. Yeah, Six exactly. rounds. Exactly. Let's go. Let's go. Um, no, yeah. I, I didn't spend, I didn't spend a lot of time on them. I was, I was really more focused on, like, how what are all of the things that are different that I need to break my brain on? So I, I didn't spend a lot of time on the missions. I wasn't like, Oh, angle one. Oh, this is the one right. where stuff doesn't show up on the board. And I went, I hate you. Um, <laughs> we all do. So we all do. Yep. I, say, yeah. I, I was pleased because my, my favorite and, and I'm going to get hate for this so much. My favorite eighth edition scenario was watchtower. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Um, yeah, I, 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 that, that was my favorite. Well, there had uh, to be one in the world. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm it. But seeing the change to Watchtower now where he's like, no, you can use a hill, you can use this. And it's not just a binary win loss. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a much more mature gamer now, that's just bonus points. Like, perfect. I like the changes to Watchtower. I can still play Watchtower if I want, and I will hold that tower all day, but I'm not going to auto win from it much that's better. Right. That's right. Yeah. I, I, Pretty much like the scenarios. I thought they were... I like what they did. I like how they kind of changed not only deployment, but a little bit of, like, who's going first and what's going on. There's a couple things I didn't like. But le legitimately, they were, like, six not-too-complicated, but but varied scenarios. Pretty pretty good. Like, I read through them, and I was like, yeah, this is what I was expecting. Six solid scenarios. Like, at least five of them. I, I, I agree. I don't love the whole things back. The forced hold things back in reserve one, so... But, you know, that's fine. Um, Terrain. Hey guys, there's real terrain rules. <laughs> what? How about that? We, we can do that. <laughs> yeah, and and like it's real. It has an impact, like a big impact. Um, you don't want big open empty boards. You want hills and forests and buildings. They have rules. They matter. They disrupt charges. They rob you of rank bonuses. They're difficult and dangerous terrain. Really matters. They block line of sight. They make it so shooting armies just can't line up and just blow you to smithereens. But they do a lot passed. of other things too, um, like it's it it's actually a pretty deep and interesting set of terrain rules. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, yeah, I I don't know what else to say. It's good. Uh, there you go. So um, cool, good stuff, and you know it's it, you've got the old stuff like. Archers can be firing an extra rank and stuff on a hill. That's all present. You can draw a line of sight to everybody, and everybody can draw a line of sight to you. But there's a lot of other stuff going on, too. I, I do really love the way it, like, disrupts charges. Like, there should be lots of terrain around the board because making people charge over terrain, if they're in closed formation, disrupts their charges. They don't get the initiative bonus. They don't. They can lose rank bonus. Um, and, but, but open order units don't suffer that just to a degree and so on. So it's like it's really cool actual distinctions of it makes the units more interesting. Uh, given Brendan, your, uh, your open order army there with Beastmen, uh, I'm sure you're looking for a heavy terrain board, which makes sense. And open order and move through cover. Like yeah. the, mm. like that was one of the things where, as I was thinking about what age of Sigmar boards looked like, I was like, oh wow, what a bunch of rules I'll never get to use. And when I got to the terrain section of, of the rule book, I was like, oh yeah, no, we we need to make sure that like there's there's stuff on the board like this is this is the point yep and it was funny too because we set up a piece of terrain and we didn't we didn't remember to make things difficult or dangerous we kind of forgot that we, we set up all the terrain and they were what they were like this is a hill there's a building and so on but but we forgot to like make things difficult or dangerous or whatever and so then we put, I put this, like, I have this little particular piece of hill terrain that models will not stand on. Like, just refuse. And Brendan had his big unit full of, like, metal models that was not in a tray. And he can't, this poor guy had to, like, navigate this hill because, of course, that's where his unit ended up for most of the game. <laughs> and this, he has that giant yep. beastman. Remember, you know, the beastman banner bearer? The dude's, like, looking yes. like this with the big flag. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that dude, just, no chance. Yeah, just... No no Mal Nichols is going to hold that guy up. No, no way. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, deployment is mostly a back and forth thing, one unit at a time, then all war machines, then all characters, which will be familiar to many previous editions. In most scenarios, but not all, you then roll off to see who goes first, and the person who finished deploying first gets a plus one bonus to the roll. So again, familiar. It's not always the case, um, by the by. Like some of the scenarios don't grant that bonus and so on. Okay. Um, units might move or have other effects pre-game, very dependent on the units and the armies. So like pay attention if you've got sort of vanguard moves and stuff like that, which will be, again, familiar to people from previous editions and from AOS. Like this is a classic thing uh, of sort of pre-game moving. Uh, and your formation matters a lot, and what frontage you need to claim a rank bonus is based on the unit type. Unit type and formation combine to give the unit a real role. So what that means is, like, for regular infantry, you have to be five across, and then less than, basically less than five, like, at least five across, and then that or less deep to be in fighting formation. So in other words, if you're five across, you can't be more than five deep. To still be in fighting formation. So you have to be wider than you are deep or equal to be in fighting formation and claim a rank bonus. Or if you go longer, then you go in a marching column, which means like you can't charge you can, and stuff like that. But um, Yeah, you can triple your movement though as yeah. as your march instead of doubling it, which is which is a cool thing to do. Um and will certainly pair well with units that are drilled and can take free, you know, free changes and be able to move stuff around a little more easily. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Cygnus Maximus is that right. No deeper than the frontage. Yes. If you go wider, then you can go deeper, right? So it's kind of the way, like the unit's going to expand out like that. Um, like pulling the corner of a picture. <laughs> yeah. You can't just pull the little side bars. You got to pull the corners to make the thing bigger. Okay. Uh, and, you know, that combined with like the like certain units obviously they have different unit strengths and different numbers to be to, to claim that rank bonus like you mentioned earlier branded monstrous infantry only need to be three across uh what is it heavy infantry you need to be four across four right? across yeah yeah um stuff like chariots is three across those kinds of things so yeah okay cool uh rock and roll and then finally, you will roll to generate the spells pre-game, but you can swap one over. You do have to say your spell, like technically you have to say your spell uh, lore when you're list building, but then you don't know what spells you actually have until you roll a number of dice equal to your wizard level. Um, you don't get to just automatically choose off of doubles anymore, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you have to But then there's a lot more, because you have the lore specific, there's the a lot more signatures per se that you can swap into. Well, you can still only swap a max of one. Right. But like you have more options because you can yeah, do yeah, like, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a high elf. I can swap to the, the high maid or not high yeah, magic, yeah, the yeah. Lord Safari. It gives me a, a slightly separate option to kind of offset that doubles don't let you pick. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, KR says, serious question. Since most of us used movement trays in Warhammer fantasy battles, how irritating is switching formations going to be? Um, I mean, if you're locking in a plastic movement tray like what GW is selling, that kind of bad product, then annoying. If you're using like what Minimag trays made where they actually are like can sort of be attached in different ways and just like magnet together in a really nice way, um, not that annoying. It'll be actually pretty easy to just be like plop, plop and kind of reconnect them. Plus, so. also, like I, I, I thought about this like formations I would take. Very rarely am I going to be like so far deep on that that I'm not just basically turning a unit from this way to this way. Yeah. Sure. And if I have to do that to switch to marching, I'll just put the command squad up front and everything else will leave sideways and march it and then just adjust as I need to. Sit. Like you can do it quickly sure. without much hassle. Yeah. But yeah, like there's there's tools out there that make things, it even it's easier. Not super annoying. Yeah. I didn't find myself like radically changing formation very often, but I mean, I don't know. Maybe I will in the future. Yeah, the, the biggest pain is going to be going from skirmish to open order to skirmish. Right. Um, if if such a situation were to ever come up in in your game, typically you're going to go from skirmish to open order, and chances are that's where you're going to stay. Yeah. Chances are you're going to go from skirmish to open order to the dead pile off the battlefield. <laughs> 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 that's usually... You're going you're gonna to reform off the table. Um. <laughs> Somebody asked what the size of the table was. Um, it's 60 by 44. So it is using the new updated size. 
it's not a six by four table. It is a 60 by 44. Um, so it's the current AOS slash 40 K size. Okay. Another question that is not indexed in the, in the book. Yeah. That was very hard to find. <laughs> At the beginning of the game, yeah. Brent and I were setting up. We were like, wait, how big is the table supposed to be? Yeah, my, my brain defaulted to six by four. So I, I, I didn't even like even content creators I've seen out there have not even saw what you guys apparently found. So that's really interesting. Yeah, it's in there. It is in there. I, I will. I, I will, trust you. I can endeavor to find it again. Now, God knows where it is, but it is in here. I read it. <laughs> I know it. Um, but yeah, like... Um, it is, uh, it's using that newer size. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, God only knows where this rule is. Like you'd think it'd be right here in the beginning, <laughs> wouldn't you? Right. That's, yeah. that's where you or they would like have said it somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, an article like, Hey, we're using this, this table size now. Uh, I think they kept this on the down low cause they didn't want to pit. They didn't want to scare like, uh, old hammer players away who'd be like, I refuse. I refuse to change well, my table size. I mean, the, the logic, logical Boom. argument was like bigger Found base it. sizes meant bigger table size, but up to 1,000 no. points is 30 by 44, 1,001 to 3,000 points is 44 by 60, and 3,001 points and above is 44 by 90. What page is that on, Vince? Page 285, sir. And what, what's okay. the points between? The, the the small size? 1,000 uh, and... 1,001 to 3,000 is on the 44 by 60. Okay, all right. I was making sure it wasn't like 1999 and all of a sudden we're playing a huge game on a really tiny table. Okay, we're good. Yep. The average game, though, notably is between 2,000 and 3,000 points, so I think that settles the 1999 debate. Oh, sure. Fair. Yeah, all right. 2,400 it is, right? 25. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna start it the also East Coast says match. if you want, yeah, we're doing 2400. There's there's another thing that says the you can also play on a 48 by 72, but if you don't want that, then refer to this one below. So you can use your four by six as well. So it allows for both. So okay, okay. So there you go. I guess I guess the answer is both. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Ask your to. Moving yeah. on. <laughs> so okay, cool. There you go. Uh, cool, cool. Um, right on. Uh, so pregame done. Let's talk. Let's get into the phases. Let's talk strategy phase. Uh, all right. By the way, if you haven't hit like yet, hit like. Uh, just we're we're like two hours into this, chugging along. Uh, maybe maybe hit that like button. Thank you very much for sticking with us, everybody. I hope you all find this exciting. All right, let's talk strategy phase. This is the new phase, kind of at the beginning. And cool phase. It is a cool phase. Um, this mm-hmm. contains basically four sub phases: start a turn, command, conjuration, rally, fleeing troops. Okay. Um, start a turn is where you just kind of do all start of turn cleanup things. Lots of armies will have different start of turn things that they do. Command is a new thing. We'll talk about that in just a second. But most leaders now have command abilities, kind of a la AOS, but they don't use like command points or anything. Conjuration is using the first time you use magic in the turn. Um, so this is uh, where you cast enchantment and hex spells. And then rally fleeing troops. Um, this is where you try to rally anybody who's running away. Pretty classic thing here. Um, so as I said, new command abilities. Um, there are no command points. It's just if your army has units that have it and those characters meet the conditions for usage, they can each use them once per turn. This is a thing Brendan and I screwed up. I thought you were only allowed to use one per turn. So both of us just used one per turn and it was fine. We were totally balanced. <laughs> we, but, but you know, we just made a choice and went about our sweet way. And uh, no, you all get to do your thing once. Each hero gets to do one of their command abilities in that phase. Um, so you can also cast hexes and deba or hexes and enchantments, most of which can't be cast into combat. Um, nor can they be cast if you are in combat. So because those are two separate things. Um, but some can. It, it really depends. It, I'd say it's like 50-50 on enchantments and hexes. Some can, some can't. They will say. Uh, and then 
Uh, magic, very simple. No more mini game. Magic is just each wizard can attempt to cast all of their spells once per turn. That's it. So if you're a level four wizard and you have four spells, you can cast four spells. You will often not have valid targets for all four of your spells, <laughs> especially as the game progresses, but you can do it like it is within your potential. To cast a spell, you simply roll 2d6 and add your level. If you hit the number, you cast the spell. That's it. No dice pools, no dice game. Wizards have unlimited dispel attempts. As far as we can tell. As far as we can tell. <laughs> but have a limited range at which they do so. And importantly, they can't dispel if they're engaged in combat. Um, so level 1 and 2 wizards dispel 18 inches away. Level 3 and 4 wizards dispel at 24 inches away. And no matter what, once per turn, you can choose to use a faded dispel, which is just a straight up 2d6 roll. Um, but you don't get any bonus to it. Um, so if you're going up against a level 4 wizard, could be a, a, a tough, tough dispel. Um, miscast can happen when casting or dispelling. Like if you roll snake eyes... You're going over to the miscast table, baby. Uh, so that's fun. And that's, I think the only miscast the one... that happened was in our game, real quick. Was was Brendan? You didn't. You, you rolled one miscast on a dispel, right? That was the only time. Yeah, I think I think with my wizard that was out on the out on the edge, and it was just like that was the one that ended up charging the chariot, and that wound ended up costing me big time. <laughs> yes, my chariot crew killed his wizard because I got I snuck one wound through on him. My, my, sorry, my war machine crew. Yeah, the catapult, yeah. The catapult oh, crew ended up good. killing his that's wizard because he had one wound left. And we were like, got him. I, I uh, have to say, as someone who was a big fan of the 8th edition magic, it, it, for the, the, the sins of it aside, I, I enjoyed that mini game because I like the interaction between your opponent and yourself. Um, the miscast for dispelling offsets all the, all the feelings of, oh, I missed my mini game because the mini game is there in a different way. Because now your opponent has to sit there and go, ooh, do I risk it or not? And yeah, that's sure. going to make for fun moments just as many times as we've had. I'm throwing six dice and blowing myself up. Let's see if it goes off. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me tell you what. Uh, I'm here for it every time. Let's go. Let's go. I play Skaven. I'm, I'm here for I'm here for outlier <laughs> chances of small, catastrophic things happening. That's, that's basically my play style. Um... Okay, and then also, lastly, this is where you roll for ambushers, but they don't come on until later. So that's that's just an important thing to note. You roll to check your ambushers here in this strategy phase. All right. Overall, Brendan, what did you think of the uh, strategy phase? I really liked it. The Specifically, the the command sub-step. It'd be really cool for all of our heroes to have done all the things that they could have done. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> but the, the thing that was coolest with that was it was a way of making your heroes feel more hero-y um, yeah. that your army has a, a set of you know effectively commands that you can do that are very tomb king oriented yep mine are you know effectively things that are very beastman oriented that you know change and manipulate the game in in a really cool way and one of the things that you know i kind of have my eye towards is is that space and what they plan on doing with that because well, I don't want to see it necessarily go the direction of heroic actions in Age of Sigmar where you're paralyzed by choice. Right. That is a space where you can do unusual things. Um, you know, you can introduce a new character who has access to a different kind of command that shifts the way um, maybe you want to construct your army or the way that you... Um, maybe build a, a chunk of it to do a specific task within your list. And and I think that's that's really cool. That's the most exciting bit of it. And it's a it's kind of like a neat like little bookkeeping phase where you kind of set yourself an order before just a bunch of stuff happens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I like a lot of the commands. Like I'm legitimately excited about my Tomb King commands. Like there's some other people obviously who I didn't who I didn't get to use other heroes and stuff that have some neat ones. Um, like I love the Necrotect command. Uh, that was cool. I got to use that like one turn um, again, cause I thought we were only using one. So that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I really love the tomb Prince and tomb King one. 
Um, by the way, there is a uh, command range, and the way command range works is heroes broadcast a command range a number of inches equal to their leadership, unless they're the general, um, in which case it's or the general or the BSB, the army BSB, in which case it's 12 inches, and unless they're on a behemoth, uh, in which case it's 18 inches. So, there you go. Um, so, you know, I mean, like, in general, it's, you know, you're, you've got some bubbles that are going on, but all your heroes have some kind of command range that they that they can pass out their, their kind of presence on the battlefield for. And, yeah, I'm... It, it's cool. I like it a lot. Um, I really love all the ones that I've got in my army. I know you were pretty excited about yours. Even when turn one, the first thing you did was your guy went stupid. That's <laughs> just like... First, first dice roll of the game. <laughs> that like, that like once the game got started, like, cool, I got my cool command, my cool, we're going to load up my hero. Boom. One, you're like, that was bad. And I was like, yeah, it was. That was, <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> instantly stupid uh but that's all right that dude did okay he came back around so you know he was all right um i mean technically he was still alive at the end of the game so you know he he he, he's fine he lives to fight another day all right so that's kind of strategy it's it's depending on what you're going on with it's generally pretty quick um i do like this magic system a lot I will say it's probably the second best one they could create. Obviously, the best would be if we went back to 5th edition cards just for the raw goofiness of it. Uh, But but other than that, we're definitely... I got a full set right up there, Vince. You want to come play? Yes, yes, (laughs) my man. (laughs) Same. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Movement phase. All right. Let's talk movement. All right. So movement phase, this is obviously, again, you've got kind of four sub-steps. You've got declare charges, you charge moves, your compulsory moves, and then your remaining moves. Now, there's a couple important things to note here about this phase. Is that obviously the first thing you do is declare charges. Um, and specifically, the active player, which is the person whose turn is being taken, goes through and declares all their charges. And which unit is being charged. Like this unit is charging here. This unit is charging here. This unit is charging here. If there's no way you can avoid charging multiple units, you do have to charge multiple units and so on and and account for that. Um, And then once you've declared all your charges from all your people who can legally charge, i.e. like they didn't flee, they're not in marching column, you know, other things that would stop them from charging. Then the... Opposing player says their charge reactions, right? And so, which is hold, stand, and shoot, or flee, right? And then, like, in response to that, if you flee, there's redirects, and all that kind of stuff is still there. You can only redirect once um, if uh, on that, and so on and so forth. Um, but, and then the other important thing to understand is this is also the phase where conveyance spells happen. Um, this is kind of the easiest one to remember, I think, because conveyance, movement, they you get it, right? Like you get it. It's very direct, this one. But importantly, those get cast in the remaining moves uh, subphase. So after charges. So if you, and like, we'll talk about how you charge in a moment, because there's some spells you might read and it's like, oh, This gives the unit fly 10. And you're like, oh, that'd be awesome. I can put it on the unit and then charge. And it's like, no, 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 right? (laughs) Your unit has already, we've gone past that point already, right? That's, that has already, that train has left the station by the time you're putting on there. So things like that are actually pretty innately balanced because they end up being just for like maneuverability and stuff like that or setting up later turns as opposed to suddenly making a unit explode 30 inches across the table on a charge. So, Okay. Things here. I, I said that all charges are declared by active player, yada yada. How does charging work? I'm gonna charging works like this. It is your move plus the highest 1d6 of a 2d6 roll. So in other words, let's say you charge, let's say your base move is five inches. That means the maximum you can charge, your charge range is eleven inches, because you just it's six plus your move, the highest roll you can get on a d6. That's the farthest out you can declare against a unit. And you're going to roll two dice, and you're going to select the highest dice and put that together with your move. That's how far you charge. Now, 
If you're going over difficult terrain, you take the lowest dice and you put those two together. If you have swift stride, you get to do the highest dice and add an additional d6. Right? And so on and so forth. So like there's other rules. I'm just listing a couple. There's other rules that can modify this. But that's basically what it is. Uh, Chuck, what do you think about charging? I, I legitimately really like this new charging. I, I like it because I will always think back to the one game where I played against dwarves and my Dragon Prince bus unit failed an 18-inch charge. And then the dwarves successfully made a 13-inch charge after I stumbled forward. And I'm like, how can they move faster than me? Sure. It makes it feel like cavalry are fast and infantry are slow. Um, I am curious how this is going to play in like the posturing at the start of games. Because like, remember, you'd have those games where you're just kind of like slowly moving up and feeling each other out. Obviously, I want to go much quicker because we're going to be farther away and our charges isn't as long, potentially. So I like it. I think it's going to get us into the combat situation quicker, or at least within range of these shorter spells, these shorter, you know, bow shots and all that. So I am a fan of this new charge. Style. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, Tartar Sauce, you're correct. You are correct. It's not a requirement. They said either table works. Um, okay. So, yeah, Brendan, thoughts on charging? The This feels like the nice middle ground between exactly what Chuck is talking about, you know, his his bad experience between, you know, cab versus dwarves and what 7th edition was, which was your charge was just double your movements. And there were right. situations that you could get into where you could just never charge your opponent. You know, there was right. there was no situation that you could move into where your opponent wasn't going to just kind of idiot their way into like, oh my god, I'm in charge range now. You also couldn't pre measure in that version of the game, which you know was a was a different thing. Um, this is that nice middle ground where the things that are fast feel like they have an advantage, and the things that are slow, you know, have some kind of disadvantage. But it's somewhere in the middle where a lot of things still have a chance, and you can position yourself in a place where, yeah. Mine is an average charge and yours is an above average charge, but you can still fail and that is still going to put me in a place to to do okay. And right, you know, you try to make the long charge with your knights, you move forward and suddenly I'm in range. Like, okay, now I have a choice to make in my next turn. So um, I really like the decision made here. It feel, It's the middle ground that feels good for right. the gameplay and then also for the people at the table. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and Rory, that would mean you have a very, very wide frontage um, because at least half of the more than more than half, at least half. I don't remember of your of the fighting rank of your unit has to be made up of, of rank and file models. Uh, so if you're trying to pack a, a unit with that many heroes, you have a huge frontage on that that unit. Um, OK, uh, so uh, you can't end your move within one inch of an enemy ever, but unless you're charging, obviously, but, you know, normal moves. Um, however, you can move within one inch during your movement. Hallelujah. That sounds like mm -hmm. such a small thing, but it matters so much because the units don't have these like force fields around them, right? That, uh, that force you to get like railroaded. The number of times I, I had a regular high elf opponent back in the day who would just like two eagles, two eagles. <laughs> yep. Great. Awesome. Love it. Yep. More of this, please. Well, even even still, I like that um, that one inch range doesn't affect your own units anymore. Right. I can be much like it's the easiest thing to forget. Like like you're friendly, who cares? You're next to each other, but you had to technically be one inch away, and it's always like, do I call my opponent out or do I not care about it? I hated yep. that so much. So dumb. I know. Yep. Now it's one inch of an enemy. It's great. Okay. Um, if the charge fails, you move the high roll on the 2d6 forward, which potentially puts you in a bad position. So in other words, if you roll the charge and it fails, whatever the higher die was, you move that many inches forward. So like, that's pretty much that. Like, you, let's say they were 10 inches away, you, you're a move, move 5 unit, you roll your 2d6, you get a 4 and a 1. Whoops, it's only 9 inches, it's not enough. You move 4 inches forward. There you go. So you are still moving, and it can pull you out of position. I like that a lot, rather than just sitting there, um, because I do. Uh, I love that that's then like potentially got you out of position. You might know where you want to be, so there's a risk. It's, it's great. Um, there's no swift reform; it does not exist, which is great. Um, it's hard to maneuver your units or drastically change facing an act, so you need to think well ahead 
like uh it's like it's i really love the you get one thing it's your one thing you can do it's like you know pivot wheel reform etc and it's just like that's your one thing um and yes as i said earlier this is where you cast your conveyance which are generally your movement and teleport spells overall i really like the new movement rules i think they did a great job with with it so also even just i can pivot with something that's next to the board edge and yeah, be yeah. off the board edge for a second yeah thank you like it, it was <laughs> uh i don't just die because my corner clipped the edge of the board and my yeah they don't jerk. pretend like the edge of the board is like the edge of the known universe you just cease existing yeah, yeah you can like pivot around that then your unit can mm-hmm. like sweep off the edge of the board or something and then whatever that's fine okay agreed you can't get like trapped against the the board edge effectively like right. oops now i can't turn anymore agreed and okay. even through your own own army you can technically go yeah, slightly yeah. through part of your own army in a charge so perfect good absolutely anything else you want to say on movement gentlemen oh okay let's then whoops let's go to the shooting phase the shooting let's do some shooting he's a shooter all right so shooting phase breaks down into choosing your 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 targets rolling to hit rolling to wound and then you know casualties and panic tests right uh so pretty fine it's shooting is going to be fairly familiar to people um it's it's all it feels very much like what warhammer has always been like basically like the fantasy editions um you've got a misfire chart for your stone throwers and your black powder things your your war machines that are neither just use ballistic skill and so on and so forth right um it's it's kind of what you would expect where like if you have a ballistic skill of three which is the average for a human you hit on a four up and there's a bunch of different penalties that can affect that like moving and shooting and long range and standing and shooting and cover and all those kinds of things so uh unique things about the shooting phase you should pay attention to other models block line of sight so in most cases only the front rank can fire uh and if they but if they're on a hill two ranks can fire some universal special rules will modify this and allow half the models from remaining ranks to fire, which is basically volley fire. Okay. Um, it is very easy for your own people to be in the way of your shooters or other terrain to be blocking line of sight. Terrain really matters. We mentioned it earlier, but it is really true. Many pieces of many types of terrain, like woods and hills, just straight up block line of sight. Like if the line goes through them, LOS is blocked. Period. Uh, and then having a ballistic skill of higher than five, where it becomes two plus and ones always fail. So like ballistic skill six, seven, eight, nine, as I'm sure many of your silly high elfy heroes do, uh, you then that means you get a built-in reroll of sort with your misses where like, if your ballistic skill is six, you hit on a two, but then you get a reroll on a six. So like for whatever misses you get to reroll and on a six, you hit. And then if it's ballistic skill seven, it's on a five and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> importantly, not everything has a chance to wound. The hit table will be pretty familiar to everybody. It's pretty much the classic uh, hit table. Uh, it's actually, it's a little bit different, but it's it's pretty classic. But the wound table brought me back. It's a, it's a little more generous than it was back in the day, mm-hmm. but it's not the new version either where it just went sixes all the way to the end it's kind of the middle ground between so for example like strength three can only wound up to toughness eight it can't wound toughness nine or ten right so it does drop off after a point um which is fun i like that yeah i'm curious too because from what i've seen and from the content i've consumed granted i don't have any books in my hand yet um to really verify this but i haven't seen much toughness seven stuff out there no which means that they're using it as a lever to pull to like if they want something to be incredibly tough that's when they'll start using those so i i like that i like that it's it's not you can't okay goblin can't hurt this toughness 10 thing that's perfectly fine for me as long as there's not an infinite amount of toughness 10 things that can be easily brought against the goblin army yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I'll give you an example here. Let's talk about some some pretty tough things, right? Um, what's a good example? Where is he at? Somewhere in here. Where are you, you dumb dumb? Uh, like a demon prince is toughness five. Your chaos lord is toughness five, 
right? Like these are these are pretty tough dudes. Um, let's pick a fun big monster. Let's pick a classically super tough monster out of my own army that we all know, we all love, uh, and that was the um, oh the, the new War dragons, Sphinx. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the War Sphinx, right, or the Necro Sphinx. These things mm -hmm. back in the day were like toughness eight, if memory serves, off the top of my head. Um, they are now toughness six, right? So, like, it's you're not going to run into a huge amount of cases where you're hitting that. But keep in mind, there are things that buff toughness, items right. or spells and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. But it's it's really hard. Like, I eventually there could be something, I don't know, but, like, toughness six is pretty much where everything caps out. Um, yes, barring some shenanigans. Um, armor, here's a, this is the most important change. I want to take a moment and discuss on this. Armor is no longer modified by the strength of the weapon. True in both shooting and combat. Only the AP of the weapon or certain special rules like armor bane adjust armor. Uh, armor is also capped at a maximum of two plus. Full Woo! stop. Take that zero up, Chaos Lord. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 the first part there, I, I, and it's just because I'm so used to playing eighth and I got to play eighth regularly for the past two plus mm -hmm. years. I was so used to and I liked the strength being what gave you the eight, the armor bane essentially, the, the, the armor penetration. Um, so I, I kind of miss that, but yes, uh, armor capped at two plus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. I love only having AP and not being strength because the problem is then it made strength too good and it was always an overweighted stat because it both was it was both shooting your chance to wound way up because that's such yeah. a quickly moving table and it's then cracking through their their armor like really fast and it made it created this instant insanity where like all these magic items had to exist that were like strength doesn't affect the AP or you know the armor bonus yeah. yada 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 and all that. it just Random created this dumb race. arms race yeah exactly whereas now it's like some stuff's a bunch of stuff is just no AP. You got a decent amount of AP one, some AP two, and then there's like a few very special can openers that can drop some some bigger APs, cannons and stuff like that, right? And or have armor bane and can really do some big crackalackin'. But it, what it means is that, you know, a lot of times you're gonna see just a bunch of people running around on like three up saves, and that's just that's where it is, and you're gonna move them to a four up or a five up. And so it it feels a little heresy ish in that way, right? Where um, the like in in heresy, it's just like a lot of it is just dudes in within three up armor shooting at each other <laughs> with weapons that don't gonna, penetrate three up armor. You're gonna have models left at the end of the game. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brendan, where are you coming down on this one? I really like this. The is unfortunate that you know the the one unit that we had on the table that was super armored, the the dragon ogres didn't. Uh, didn't really get the chance to be like, oh, okay, well, you know, this is this is how good or tough this is or isn't, um, you know. And to your your point, Chuck, it, that was the thing in list building that like really tweaked my brain. Was like, yeah, this unit strength five, you know, so that's you know minus two armor that's going to hand out. And we give it a great weapon. It's going to be minus four. Like Vince's stuff is toast. Like he's like, there's nothing that's coming back from this. And I was like, oh no, it's just it's just strength seven, like. <laughs> oh okay. Um, it, it felt very good easily. though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It it felt it felt really good. It felt really clean. It wasn't another layer of math that had to be done. Right. Um. You know, which streamlined that experience, and and so that was that was cool. It creates some weird situations, right, where you've got something that's really strong sometimes that isn't maybe pulling the armor off in the way that you think it would, but you know, it's just give them a better weapon, I guess. Yeah. And th that's that's the best thing for me to hear. Hasn't got to try this yet. Is someone who goes like, "No, it feels good," which means great. I look forward to trying it and getting that. Like, okay, yeah, this does feel good. I look forward to it. Yeah, like legitimately, it felt good because most of the time, even like your five up save, you were still making a five up or a six up or something like that. Like, wasn't always the case. But it was like, yeah, I'm still getting a spell. Like, so I get I get to roll some dice sometimes, save a guy or two. You know, like it's happening. Um, so that's cool. Um, and by the way, we, if we want to import this armor is capped at a maximum of two up full stop rule over to AOS, anytime, anytime, baby, you just yep, bring right that there. right over. Take I it. am so good with it. Uh, okay. 
Um, this is also the phase for Magic Missile and Magical Vortex spells from Wizards. Um, so this is like when they do their magic shooting. Um, these are fun. You had a lot of Magic Missiles, Brendan, right? And it yeah, did. did pretty good. I, I built for it specifically because I had a... I had a uh, artifact that lets me reroll the two wounds on magic missiles on my my one wizards so that that felt good. Um, the magical vortexes that did get out during the game were were really cool, um, and you know they did they did cool stuff. And as much as part of me misses like the super nuclear weapon purple sun that you super casted to get on the board, and it it ran rampant or when you rolled the distance for the dice, like it went nowhere and yeah, came yeah. back at you. Um, those aren't a thing. And you're like, that's, that's really fine. Like um, everything yeah. that you're doing within the context of all of the other magic as a whole, um, it, it felt like your wizards were, were doing enough. They were participating. They were buffing, they were debuffing. They were, you know, doing a little bit of damage, you know, like there's none of the wizards are cheap. That's right. just kind of the way that it is, but you you always felt like they were participating in some way, shape, or form, and that felt really good. Yep. I, I will equally miss the moments where I've thrown that Dwellers Blow or Purple Sun out and just won the game versus the game where I've thrown it out and lost the game or tied mm-hmm. the game because everything died because the way it bounced around. It's Yeah. Those, those times were fun, but also, yeah, it's going to be fun to learn this new style and Vortex is having a different place of telling a story as opposed to just let's see who wins the game because I got double six. Yeah. As well. I like how most of your, by the way, we didn't mention this earlier, but it's worth mentioning a lot of the, um, a lot of the, your, your wizards have choices of different spell lores. So like, for example, my Lich Priest can take from necromancy, elementalism or illusion, which is fun. Um, which means you can kind of build for different things. You can have your wizards, like if you want to lean more into shooting with your wizards, like you can lean into a lore that has more magic missiles or magical vortexes or something like that. So you, you can kind of make those decisions and say like, how much do you want magic to be present in this phase? Right. So yeah, it's cool. Okay. And then of course you can't shoot in combat. You can't shoot into combat. So blah, blah. Exactly what we would expect. Classic fantasy thing. All right. Combat. The combat phase. Um, again, choose and fight a combat. Again, you're doing the thing where it's like, okay, active player picks a combat. You resolve all the way through that combat, going from initiative 10 down to initiative 1. There is no more true strikes first or strikes last. You will see that thing occur. Like, you'll see that universal special rule, but what that means is initiative 10 and initiative 1, and those can be modified. So things can change. Um, so it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean like some kind of supernatural thing uh, where it's just happening always before or always after. It's just everything is initiative and initiative is everything. You figure out who fights, you hit, you remove casualties, and then so on and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, people break or whatever. And then you choose to either restrain and reform, uh, which is a very thing you will be doing a lot uh, where you don't go chase them because you want to like, stop yourself and turn and reform and face a new direction to either because you're expecting to get charged on the next round or something like that. Um, or you can choose to pursue or overrun. This is also where the thing happens where you're taking these sort of break tests where you can choose to where they either break and flee. It's not choose, but they either break and flee or they fall back in good order or they give ground. So, or nothing because something you can stop, give ground. Um, like that's a thing that Tomb Kings will will do with a lot of their stuff is just they they never give ground so just fun. Uh, okay, I talked about some of this already. Everyone in the fighting rank gets to fight, which is the front rank, but if they aren't in contact with the enemy, they only make one attack regardless of profile. Supporting attacks is fairly rare depending on the army. Like it really depends on kind of how much how many how much spearman options you have or things like that. <laughs> Um, not all armies have that. I, like looking through, there wasn't like I can see a lot of armies where it's just like supporting attacks aren't really a thing because you're just never going to take troops that really have them. If all models in the fighting rank die, those who step up don't fight. Just like older editions of Warhammer, as I said, everything's calculated by initiative. Initiative ten, which is also impact hits, strike first stuff happens there, and then strike last, which is initiative one. That's also stomps and things like that. Big monsters making stompy stomps on you. Um, when you charge, you get either plus three or plus four to your initiative, four if you're in the flank. Well, for how far you went, it's based on the inches you traveled. 
And so, like, it's usually at least three or four, but it could be less. Um, but it's a huge bonus for landing a charge. Um, combat resolution is tricky, but really nice. Natural roll, try to explain this very quickly here. If the natural roll is higher than your leadership, then you break and flee. If your natural natu leadership. Yes, yeah. well, then your leadership. It's not oh, your natural yeah. leadership, because your leadership could be modified. That's true. That's true. Sorry. Second your leadership could be modified right. by like a spell or something. And you're, so you're rolling against your current leadership, right? Now, if your natural role is equal to or lower than your leadership, but the modified role is higher. In other words, if you're in the band in the middle, right, then you fall back in good order. So you retreat out of combat, and automatically rally. You two extensions away and then you turn around. If it's lower or a double one, you give ground. So you back up two inches and then your enemy can choose to either come forward or stay where they are. Okay. Um, and then in all cases, the unit that won can either restrain and reform, which is a leadership test to restrain and reform, or they can pursue and count as charging in the next turn. If the winner wipes out the enemy, they can overrun. Which, that was a thing that happened. I had my little skeleton, skanking, skirmishing skeletons, which is a thing I can do now. Chuck, this is very exciting for me. I can have little units of skanking, skirmishing skeletons. Do you know how excited I am about this? Unreasonably excited about this. <laughs> this is not a thing just, I ever had, buddy. I, I, just as excited as I am that I can have, uh, I forget what they're called, like the little side, not regiments. Uh, what are they called? Detachments. Oh, detachments. Yeah. Detachments. Yeah. detachments is a high yeah, up now. The I'm detachments, just like, yeah, that we all got detachments. Yes, exactly. I, I, I always loved that about Empire, but now I get to do it, so I don't have to play Empire. I can just keep playing my high elves and get all the I fun. I agree. I, I tried it. I had a little detachment of archers. It never did anything, but I did have it. It was like, okay, it's cool. <laughs> um, but like, uh, I put my little skeletons, like, I don't know, what were they, Brendan? Maybe like four inches or something, five inches in front of my, my chariot block. And I was like, yeah, we're good. Yeah, like it, it, was, it was just enough where like, <laughs> you know, cool, Brendan, like you're, you're so screwed. You have to charge this unit because if you don't, I'm going to charge through it. I was like, yeah, yeah, fine. Like I'll, I'll charge them and. Um, and that was like our first, like honest to goodness combat of, yeah. of old world. And it was my dragon ogres and my shagath ripped them to pieces. Yeah. Just and crushed like, them. Cool. Overrun mechanic. And it's like, yeah. Oh, well it's just, you know, it's just like a, a D six or whatever. And, or it's two D it was just like another charge roll. And like my dragon ogres rolled like, like just enough. Like they rolled like the three or four that it was. And then the shagath rolled like an 11, but you have to pursue straight forward um through your facing which brought them right into the meat of vince's tomb king on chariot and his uh entourage of chariots that was around him and that's and that's where vince goes oh no i've lost the game and on my side i go yes we're gonna <laughs> win this game and that's when we learn the next part about the combat phase which is combat resolution and yep. how important units with ranks are. Yep, yep. <laughs> it uh, uh, makes a real makes a real difference. Uh, makes a real difference. Uh, so at any rate, yeah, overrun is a thing. So like, I'm <coughs> I'm not sure what like I think about chaff and all of that, um, and and how with, it works because of the way overrun works and stuff like that. With like pregame moves and stuff like that, or being able to set them up far enough ahead of your mm -hmm. army, they're great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but very few things have that, obviously. Sure. Yeah, I mean there's a new what what uh there's a new thing called chariot runners, which is usually attached to, to I think it's always attached to skirmishers, which I'm very excited about in Tomb Kings, obviously chariots are a big part of my army. But they're an interesting little skirmishing unit that can like count the chariots as part of their units. So they can kind of spread out around the chariots and like block it up and the chariots can see through them and move through them and stuff like that. But they can be a little like cloud around your chariots and that's what those little skanking skirmishing skeletons are and it's just a cool idea it's a neat thing and i was just glad to see it in the game so a lot of fun and it does end up then acting as chaff but yeah you've got to be real careful about it um so yeah there you go okay uh anything else on combat we want to say chuck anything else that uh that jumped out of you here you want to talk about in the combat phase i, I i'm just a really big fan of it like i said it, it you're not locked up combat feels like it matters a lot more than it ever did before yep and, and which makes leadership and initiative much more important because of the step up rule so 
I mean, in the context of this whole rule set, I lo love what they've done with combat. Yep. Yep. Uh, let me just say, for those of you out there, by the way, who are looking for a good... If you're interested in getting into this game and you're looking for a good star army, or starter army, uh, don't buy Bretonians. Sucker play. Uh, <laughs> that's buy Tomb Kings. Buy Tomb Kings. Okay? Yeah. Tomb Kings, There's a, in, in AOS, I pretty much hate Undead. They have a bunch of rules I hate. In Worm of Fantasy, I am all about the Tomb Kings. I love dead armies. I ignore just so many rules. Like... Fear, nope. Terror, nope. Psychology in general, nope. Not doing any of that crap. Like, we don't do any of this. We don't We don't take break tests. We don't take penalties to hit when we're shooting. It's just not, we're just going to, we're just rolling on fives, baby. Or fours or whatever. Like, we don't modify our ballistic skill. It's just this number. Just that's what the number is. It's great. If you want to turn off, like, it is. It, this game has too many rules, play Tomb Kings. Turn off, like, 25% of them. It's awesome. I, very I, I very frustrating to play against. Yeah. I am sad that Chaldea is not there yet because, boy, do I want my poison on my five up. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Several fives, I I'll take sixes. But also, if you're playing Tomb Kings uh, and you have big blocks, just get used to saying when someone says they're going to charge you, be like, oh, cool, fear test. Yeah. Uh, so on turn, <laughs> funny you mentioned that. Brendan, what turn did I remember my entire army caused fear? Was At the like end four? of the game. After <laughs> the whole game was over. <laughs> We didn't Come make a fear bits. check that entire game, baby. <laughs> Nothing. He was charging me left and right. I mean, most of the time, I think you probably landed basically every charge. Like, I don't know if I ever, I think I charged you like a with, few times. With the, with the your serpents, riders. you did. Yeah. The, so, the, the snake riders were chargers. Yeah. they were. They were I they felt were. really bad about that when I left your house and I was like, well, I, I lost. So, you know, good. And I'm flipping through my rules. And I think the first thing I texted you when I was going through the Universal Special Rules was, Hey, Vince, my whole army has this rule called Warband, where my bravery is improved by the number of ranks I have, yeah. meaning that my <laughs> army is basically bravery 10. And you're like, <laughs> oh, that's a good rule to know. And so then I was like, now I feel less bad about us forgetting bravery yeah. for the fear test because it probably wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It wouldn't have mattered anyway, so it's fine. Yeah. As a quick shout out, if you want to see the the fear from Tomb Kings in action, uh, Mountain Miniatures and Skari both did Tomb Kings versus Bretts, the box sets, as far as mm -hmm. battle reports, where they show that off. So check those out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can be very impactful. <laughs> it <laughs> it sure can. <laughs> it's so funny, too, because I've played Tomb Kings since their launch in, like, 2004. Like, I've always had fear. This isn't a new thing. I just... <laughs> nope forgot uh to be fair to be fair uh fear isn't listed amongst your universal special rules instead it's one of my favorite things they do which is they give you a thing called nehekar and undead which is a universal which special costed. rule that's actually four universal special <laughs> rules hiding underneath it's a sort of matroshka of usrs uh so when i kept glancing i didn't see it right away and forgot that i had to go a level down so that's my defense <laughs> All right. Oops. Let, uh, let's let's transition that. That'll be a good transition into uh, into thoughts on our armies. Thoughts on thoughts. Uh, this will just be now. We do, there's no universe where we could have went through every freaking army and made a determination of all of them. So please just no. Forget that. Stop that right now. Okay. You can uh, you can do that as another series, Vince. Like yeah. when there's not super content, you can just it's, find a dwarf player and exactly. find a wood elf player. Just be like, hey, it's, tell me for the next twenty minutes why you like this thing. Exactly. Even right now, as we're looking at all of this from content or having the books, how you know, whatever it is, it's a fire hose, and I, yeah. we're all drinking as much as we can. But the real test of this is going to be in the next twelve months, where we slowly pace this out, play the games. And do those in-depth reviews like Vince will do. I'm sure you know we'll, we'll, yeah, there'll yeah. be multiple shows that do it. So I mean, Chuck's gonna come back when we eventually do a high elf show, and like we're gonna. Get oh, you better believe here. it. You better believe it, boy. Uh, but <laughs> but we've all got a little bit. Like obviously, all of us went to our armies first. Okay, like come yeah. on. And so we're gonna give some initial thoughts. So here's my thoughts on Tomb Kings. I was already talking about it a little. God in heaven, I love this army so much. I. <laughs> 
that I which 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 version which version like overall or is it specific like mortuary cults no all of it all of it I, oh, I like okay, okay. I don't honestly Cetra's army is like my least favorite just because like I like Cetra he's fine um but Cetra's army Cetra's such a huge point investment he's like almost 500 points he's just such a giant chunk of change on the battlefield and it's just really hard for him to like earn back those points um like don't get me wrong he's a beast and a half like you know Cetra does not kneel but it's just not the way I like to play I mean you know Brandon can tell you my list was just like stuff just stuff a hundred things yeah <laughs> just <laughs> You you set you set your army down on the tray and I went. I don't think I've brought enough units to this game. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he was playing Beastmen, to be clear. So it's like you know that should tell you how I build an army, right? Um. And so, but like I just I love every unit in this army. Um. Tomb Kings are great. Their new command abilities are really fun. Um. Your banner bearer guy feels like a sort of points tax, but it's it's whatever. He's not expensive. <laughs> the your your lich priest your your sort of high priest is fantastic. Um like super cool dude arise rocks um you have good magic item support for him like you can double tap arise there's a magic item that lets you once a game double tap arise um so you can like really super duper refill a unit or something like that i used it to actually heal my tomb king because he almost died and i managed to get him yeah but then you can't do it anymore way. though it's all right he, he really fun way to fun way to balance it yeah and uh and then so like it's it's a good it's a good thing. Uh, the Necrotech has a really cool one. Like all the all the all the characters feel cool. Um, the uh, all the units feel great. Like skeletons are skeletons. They're still just bad dumb guys who don't die very like who die easily ish, but don't give away to break tests and stuff. And you to use them for big ranks. Love Tomb Guard. Tomb Guard feel awesome, especially buffed in certain ways with the right things. Snake Riders are amazing. I love always love Snake Surfers. I my Snake Surfers were just yeah. on a tear. Those dudes went ham and just just so good. I love Snake Surfers back in the day. I still love them now. Uh, I'm very excited to get some Shabti on the table. I didn't get to play any War Swing through Shabti the first game, so I'm, I'm interested to try those. The Archers are fun. The Screaming Skull Catapult sucked. Uh, because it's a stone thrower, so it's bad. Um, but it does cause a leadership penalty, which is like makes me want to keep putting it on the table because leadership penalties are so big. And uh, the um, and then yeah, like what else? What am I? Uh, I mean, there's tons of other units I'm forgetting. Oh, the um, uh, casket of souls. It looks awesome, and I can't wait to oh, give it a play. Beast seems to be a beast. I it's love it. So crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Just wild. So I'm very excited about that. Like I'm, you know, so uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. Um, but I, I love the whole army. I love the way it plays. I, I legitimately felt like I was playing the thing. I mean, that's what I'll say. Like the verisimilitude of playing Tomb Kings feels so real. Um, my favorite Tomb King is probably putting him in a chariot still. I have a custom Tomb King on chariot that I modified long ago. Because um, again, I could go Tomb King, <coughs> chariot. I can I can figure it out, even though they didn't sell that <laughs> kit. Uh, and so you know I I like that build a lot. Uh, I do want to try one on a on a War Sphinx just to see what that feels like, um, see if that's any good. Uh, and but yeah, overall I I absolutely love the army. I think honestly necromancy as a lore is like okay. That's what I ended up using. It was fine. It had it had some good spells. Um, but I think uh, Brandon, next time we roll, I think I want to try me some elementalism. I think that's Ooh. where that's where the I think that's where the money's at. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think I like brief, that better for how I want to play. Basically, could you a brief shout out that all the magic lores seem to be pretty good? Yeah, yeah they I'm all not, have interesting like, spells. Yeah, yeah, they, like there's sure there's always parts you don't like, but like in general, I'm not upset with any of that. Yeah, the like I'm not saying I want elementalism because I think it's stronger. I actually think it's not. I think elementalism is kind of weaker. Uh, like have just taken my my best understanding of raw power level so far, but like the way I want to play, if that makes sense, like the units I want to take and the things I want to do, uh, elementalism seems a better fit for. So I actually like that that the the spell lores all felt interesting. It's just about finding the one that kind of suits, like the the I don't know, what the the win the path to victory you have and like how you want your army to work. I guess that's what I would say. So yeah. 
there you go. But all in all, loving the Tomb Kings. Very excited to be back. Um, yeah, gonna gonna. Uh, I, I will add more to the army. Apparently, thirteen thousand plus points wasn't enough. Let's keep going, baby. <laughs> Let's keep going. Um, all right. So that's Tomb Kings. Uh, Beasts of Chaos. Brendan, throwing it over to you. What are your thoughts? So you hit the nail on the head in terms of the Tomb King. The, the Tomb Kings playing like Tomb Kings felt like Tomb Kings. And my first read through on the Beastmen, it felt like they had really captured what Beastmen are supposed to feel like. And then when we got to the table, it felt like the way that Beastmen are supposed to feel like. And and that was such a cool experience because that was an that's an army that for as long as I've played it, something always felt kind of wrong. Yeah. Um, used to have these mixed unit of gores and ungores and they were skirmishers and the way they ranked up was just really stupid. Um, and then, you know, the, they got their book at the end of seventh that they had to play through all of eighth. Cause that's how games workshop games worked where my stuff marched around in the same formation that, you know, the empire Knights marched around in. And I was like, this is stupid. Um, ambushing wasn't very good. But like we got to this game and like I want I tried to do like everything and that was a mistake because uh, your because your characters are inexpensive so I was like yeah all the characters and I spent way too much on my characters and I was like and they gotta have all these cool things um, classic but classic it was really fun though um, but so they the book is really broken down into like four distinct categories where you have your gores. Um, and their heroes, you have your Minotaurs and their heroes, you have the Dragon Ogres, and the Shagath isn't a hero anymore, he's a, just a big monster, which is which is kind of cool, but they've got some good synergy, and then you've just got, like, rest of monster category. Right. And one of the things I'm really excited about is, I feel like <laughs> I can play a bunch of games with Vince, and I can bring a different army to the game Every single time, it's going to do something different, but I can make choices where the army is going to still feel like Beastmen, but in the version that I brought. Like, I can just run a bunch of Minotaurs, I'm going to do a bunch of damage, but my ability to pursue is going to be limited. Or I can bring a bunch of gore and I can kind of do an encirclement kind of attack, where I just got a bunch of stuff coming from every different direction. They've got move through cover, they can skirmish, they can then go to open order... And then I've got stuff coming off from the ambushing side behind him. So if, you know, let's pretend Vince isn't playing Tomb Kings, um, that if they break, they're breaking into my units and, you know, pushing them further off the board, doing more damage. It was just, it was just really cool to do the list building. They transferred over some of like the really beloved artifacts and mutations and things like that, that, that came through in, in other versions of the book. It was just it felt like the army felt like it was supposed to maybe for the first time since I've ever played it. And that yeah. was, that was such an awesome experience. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be really cool for players uh, playing the army is you can do a mixed arms and feel, feel good about it. Now you, you have to be very judicious about the kind of blocks and pairings that, that you're going to take but you can absolutely take a solid center with everything out on the wings is very nebulous and fluffy and going to annoy your opponents uh, into making some decisions that maybe they don't want to make. And that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I'm really looking forward to our next game, Vince, because one, obviously we learned a lot in that first game, but, yep. but two, you know, there's 70% of that book that I, haven't had the chance to put on the table and I think they do really cool things. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. There's so much more to explore. Like, so much. It's so deep. I mean, I haven't even put the big, dumb, ugly dragon on the table yet. I'll be surprised dumb. when you do. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's it just, takes some modifications. Take those wings. Take those wings. Like, this, is, I, uh, this is the only thing that fixes it for me. Take those wing things and mummify wrap so they have oh, the sure. membrane again. That's it. It's not the you wings. do that. It's that the, model. It's the to me, it's head. wings. It's the head. I hate his head. His head's so <sighs> dumb. See, I, I like I like the head. I hate the wings. Why is this all bone? What is he? It's is he like a, is he like a dinosaur? What is he? Bone shapers. It's 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 Ozark it's a, bone reaper long ago. I, I, is that what a crocodile's head looks like? I don't think that's what a crocodile's head looks like. 
No, a crocodon. Oh, oh okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Obviously. No. <laughs> Good. You I, You know what? You sold me right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, let me tell you the most exciting thing about Beast that I saw, right? Uh, gore seemed really good. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> that is not words that have escaped my lips for, I don't know, ever. A lot of, maybe, maybe my entire life. And we, that was pretty awesome. We were both shocked yes. when, when, when that unit hit and you were like, that's what it does. And I was like, that's what it says it does. And you were like, well, that's pretty good. And I was like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how many points? And I was like, seven. Seven points a model. <laughs> Feels good. Feels good. Yeah, those guys are great. I'm just excited that Gore have a real purpose in the game again. Like, wow, what an exciting day this is. If only AOS, which has <laughs> taken so many passes at that and failed, could uh, could achieve the same thing. We'd be, we'd be better off. All right. <laughs> Let's close this out. S- Chuck. Of course, not yeah. just any high elves. There it is. Yes, a specific. There you go. Got my, yes. got my. I am excited about Terathi in the old world shirt on. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> Grant, I, I have not. Oops, sorry. Go for it. No, I was gonna say, tell me about high elves. I was say, uh, I've not got, got a chance to play any games with this yet, but I've watched a lot of content around this. Um, first and foremost, I do like high magic in this this setting. High magic is very good. Um, I. I really like how they changed instead of taking the anointed of a Syrian or this print. It's like I take a prince or I take a noble and I choose. Are you from Chars? Are you from Lothran? Are you from Kaldor? And that's how it slots into what unit it can go into and how it can unlock certain things. I love that aspect. Um, Swordmasters stonks through the roof. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I love my, I, I've played, and much to what, what Brendan said, you know, 8th edition, I could take many varied armies, like a Cavalry Army, a Phoenix Guard Army, a White Lion Army, a Swordmaster Army, a Sea Guard Army, and I'll, I'll have all these different things. Now, granted, it's a little different now, because Phoenix Guard went from a 4-up board to a 6-up board, so how impactful is that as an anvil? I don't know. It it's, remains to be seen. Combat's a little bit less attrition, so that 6-up might, might be more beneficial, but... Swordmaster stonks through the roof, white lines being able to just move through whatever they want. Even though they have great weapons, they're still high initiative. We get the modifiers and charge and all that sort of stuff. Um, I am I a like fan. Their chariots it, too, by the way. White lion chariots. Oh, I like yeah. those too. Yes, uh, and I think what you can unlock them as poor if you take the char scene. There's, there's a lot. I, I'm not fully fluent on it yet. I'm still listen. Fire hose to make it all. Um, the one thing that. I think it was a prince on a dragon gets impetuous, which means it has to charge on like a four up or something like that, or like a one, two, three has to charge, four, five, six doesn't have to. That's a little bit rougher, but I think you can still build a character in a way where if he's off on his own, he'll be okay because he's on a dragon. Um, yeah, I, I'm excited. I, I, I Do I know where high elves are going to end up on the, the level of good or bad? Uh, no, other than I know that they will at least be pretty they'll be pretty good they'll be playable they'll be fine um i'm not worried about having a terrible army here in, in, in the near future but yeah right now it's just like i'm thinking like how many sword masters can I get in this list at 14 points a model do i want to bring a lower master uh and how do i fix my core that's kind of where i'm at right now but I, i'm excited about that and that's with losing always strikes first losing my re-rolls and having to do you know like true initiative test but having decent leadership so yeah I, i'm 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 so in <laughs> for high elves, and I'm so glad to be back. I have twenty thousand points of high elves, wow. and I'm starting it. Yeah, I I, wow. I just fielded them. I, I my it might be my final game of fantasy. Just did a giant siege, right? Twenty thousand, all my high elves out, um, versus just whoever wanted to come and play against it at, at my local club. Um, but I'm starting a fresh high elf army on the new bases because I'm that excited about it. I want to put my new skills of painting that I've learned from people like Vince and, and many people along the way to a new fresh army and have it be, this is my old world army. That's, that's impressive. My dog. I, I, you know, I thought 13,000 points of tomb Kings was completely insane. You have out insane to me. Uh, <laughs> so well done. Uh, I don't know if tomb King Tristan is still in the chat, but he had mentioned eating more of tea. I want to know how many he actually has. I meant to ask him at the time. Uh, I want to know if I have more than him, and just so I can rub it in his face. 
Uh, but, <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, all right. Well, that's it. That brings us to the end. Good stuff. About three hours. Not too bad. All yeah. in all, I'm excited for this. We'll do some more shows on the old world, certainly, as it continues to evolve and grow. We'll do some army reviews. We'll do that kind of stuff. I like that I have another game to play. That's what it comes down to, most of all. Um, and it's a different itch. It scratches that different itch. 100%. It true. doesn't get in the way of Sigmar. It just goes alongside of it in an enjoyable fashion. That's what 8th edition is doing for me. This yep. going to be the same. Completely agreed. Uh, good. Clean. Uh, heavy. Heavy. Heavy with the rules. But very fun. Love the armies. Love the design. Uh, overall, I think, uh, honestly, better than I thought it was going to be by, by quite a margin. I think that's the... Um, I was, I was, I will admit, I was a bit trepidatious, but uh, they, 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 they won me over. I'm looking forward to playing some more games. Uh, so there you go, uh, Brendan. Final thoughts. I I remember it was back in like October, November. We were we were playing a game, and I said, you know, Vince, I'm super excited for Warhammer fan for Warhammer Fantasy to come back as as the old world. And you said, oh man, I don't know. And I was like. Vince, I have no expectations of this game. I said, all I want is to be able to take my Beastmen, put them on the table, and and play. And you're like, well, Brennan, when that day comes, like we can we can definitely do it. We can definitely throw down. And that was super cool. That was that was a really fun opportunity. This like Warhammer Fantasy was the game that really got me into wargaming as a whole. I'd started playing 40k, um, but I really appreciated kind of what wargaming was in in Warhammer Fantasy and I've obviously played a lot of Age of Sigmar over the last couple of years and I'm I'm really appreciative that they took a game that was not performing very well as a product and looked at maybe some of the pain points from a gameplay perspective and and looked to improve those Absolutely. We'll see what happens with the models. Um, yeah, sure. But as yeah. far as as far as the the thing that I think ultimately shapes a lot of the way that people like a game, which is how you play it, they made major improvements on on a game and and modernized it and make it uh, slightly more approachable um, to to people who want to get into it because. Boy, old old fantasy was, was yeah, it's not it. <laughs> um, no doubt on that. So I'm I'm really looking forward to getting a lot more games in. I'm really looking forward to getting, um, you know, more releases in terms of arcane journals or just new models and seeing what they do from telling the story and how they want to move it forward with with all the armies present. I I think there's a lot of opportunity here, and I I hope they capitalize on it. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Chuck, any final thought you want to leave everybody with? I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I, I, I'm just thrilled. I've been very lucky to have a club that's playing a beer and pretzel style of 8th edition fantasy the past couple of years to go to a tournament, even though it was competitive, to see the base of that scene sort of developed in a positive fashion, much like Age of Sigmar as a community where it's all positive, it's all fun, we're all learning, we're all a good time. So I'm excited to see where this is going to go. I'm excited to be part of this community as this game kind of, you know, returns, we can call it that. Um, I'm also, uh, as a side note, I guess, slight plug at the end, um, I'm excited to do content for this more than I've ever been for anything else ever. I'm doing more videos I've ever done on my content over on the Strength Hammer side, but it's just, I, I can't stop ingesting it. I can't stop being excited for it. I can't wait to get the book in my hand and go over and play our first games with it. And just see people maybe on the Sigmar side who came into Sigmar out knowing this old world, see it, maybe try it, and then start learning some of that old history because it'll just enrich your Age of Sigmar experience as far as lore goes. So sure. like o overall, this is great for people who weren't into Sigmar to see this game back, and it's great for people who are, are into Sigmar to see this game back because it's only going to enrich everyone's experience fully. Uh, Chuck's channel is Strength Hammer. I will link both Brendan's podcast and Chuck's YouTube down below uh, so that everybody can go check that out. Check him out. 
Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Do not forget to hit that like, hit that subscribe, do all those things that make all those dings. It will make you so much cooler. Uh, thank you all for watching. We really appreciate it. If you want to support the show, lots of ways you can do so. Tell your friends, share this, uh, that kind of thing on all the social media places. Uh, even though most of them are a raging trash fire, we still appreciate it. Uh, and there's also links down below. If you're going to pick up some hobby supplies, maybe you're working on your new army. There's some Amazon links down there. You don't pay anything extra, but it gives a nice kickback to the channel. There's a fun merch store, uh, down there where you can get some cool merch for the channel. And of course there's our Patreon focused on review and feedback taking your next step on your hobby journey. All of those things are much appreciated. Also, don't forget, if you're in the mood to try new games, Uncle Adam and I make games. And you can find all of those linked down below. Uh, very, very cheap. You get the whole book for only a few dollars usually. And uh, uh, comes with everything you need to play there uh, other than the figures and some dice. So, uh, check those out. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, no thank you to my co-hosts who refuse to learn anything about the game. Uh, they get no thanks. But for all of you, you're awesome. Have a great rest of your week. As always, we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>